Part one of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 and 1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775. By Abraham Tomlinson. Part one. Advertisement. Having been for several years engaged in the establishment of a museum in Poughkeepsie, I have by extensive travel and research, and by the kindness of many of my fellow citizens in the Duchess County and elsewhere, obtained numerous objects, not only curious in themselves, but valuable as materials for history. Among these are two manuscript journals, kept by common soldiers, each during a single campaign, and written at periods seventeen years apart. One of these soldiers served in a campaign of the conflict known as the French and Indian War, which commenced a hundred years ago. The other soldier, assisted in the siege of Boston by the American army in 1775 and 1776. Believing that a faithful transcript of those journals, given verbatim at literatim, as recorded by the actors themselves, might have an interest for American readers as exhibiting the everyday life of a common soldier in those wars which led to the founding of our Republic. I have yielded to the solicitations of friends and the dictates of my own judgments and feelings, and in the following pages present to the public faithful copies of those diaries. Perceiving that much of the intrinsic value of these journals would consist in a proper understanding of the historical facts to which allusions are made in them, I prevailed upon Mr. Lossing, the well-known author of the Pictorial Field Book of the Revolution, to illustrate and elucidate these diaries by explanatory notes. His name is a sufficient guarantee of their accuracy and general usefulness, and I flatter myself that this little volume will not only amuse, but edify, and that the useful objects aimed at in its publication will be fully attained. With this hope, it is submitted to my fellow citizens. Abraham Tomlinson Poughkeepsie Museum, December 1854. End of part one. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part two of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 2. Introductory Remarks. The conflict known in America as the French and Indian War, and in Europe as the Seven Years' War, originated in disputes between the French and English colonists in the New World concerning territorial limits. For a century the colonists of the two nations had been gradually expanding and increasing in importance. The English, more than a million in number, occupied the seaboard from Penobscot to St. Mary's, a thousand miles in extent. All eastward of the great ranges of the Alleghenies, and far northward towards the St. Lawrence. The French, not more than a hundred thousand strong, made settlements along the St. Lawrence, the shores of the Great Lakes, on the Mississippi and its tributaries, and upon the borders of the Gulf of Mexico. They early founded Detroit, Kaskaskaya, Vincennes, and New Orleans. The English planted agricultural colonies. The French were chiefly engaged in traffic with the Indians. This trade and the operations of the Jesuit missionaries, who were usually the self-denying pioneers of commerce in its penetration of the wilderness, gave the French great influence over the tribes of a vast extent of country lying in the rear of the English settlements. The ancient quarrel between the two nations, originating far back in the feudal ages and kept alive by subsequent collisions, burned vigorously on the bosoms of the representative colonists in America, where it was continually fed by frequent hostilities on frontier ground. They had ever regarded each other with extremes of jealousy, for the prize before them was supreme rule in the new world. The trading posts and missionary stations of the French, in the far northwest, 
and in the bosom of the dark wilderness, several hundred miles distant from the most remote settlements on the English frontier, attracted very little attention until they formed a part of more extensive operations. But when, after the capture of Louisbourg by the English in 1745, the French adopted vigorous measures for opposing the extension of British power in America, when they built strong vessels at the foot of Lake Ontario, made treaties of friendship with powerful Indian tribes, strengthened their fort at the mouth of the Niagara River, and erected a cordon of fortifications, more than sixty in number, between Montreal and New Orleans. The English were aroused to immediate and effective action in defence of the territorial limits given them in their ancient charters. By virtue of these they claimed domination westward to the Pacific Ocean, south of the latitude of the north shore of Lake Erie, while the French claimed a title to all the territory watered by the Mississippi and its tributaries under the more plausible plea that they had made first explorations and settlements in that region. The claims of the real owner, the Indian, were lost sight of in this discussion, and it was a significant question asked by an Indian messenger of the agent of the English Ohio Company. Where is the Indian's land? The English claim it all on one side of the river and the French on the other. Where does the Indian's land lie? The territorial question was brought to an issue when in 1753 a company of English traders and settlers commenced exploring the headwaters of the Ohio. The French opposed their operations by force. George Washington was sent by the Virginia authorities to remonstrate with the French. It was of no avail. The English determined to oppose force to force, and in the vicinity of the now flourishing city of Pittsburgh, in western Pennsylvania, the French and Indian War began. Provincial troops were raised, and armies came from England. Extensive campaigns were planned, and attempts were made to expel the French from Lake Champlain and the southern shore of Lake Ontario. Finally, in 1758, three armies were in motion at one time against French posts remote from each other, Louisbourg in the extreme east, Ticonderoga on Lake Champlain, and Fort Duquesne, where Pittsburgh now stands. General Sir James Abercrombie commanded the expedition against the Ticonderoga, accompanied by young Lord Howe as his lieutenant. The French were under the command of the Marquis Montcalm, who was killed at Quebec the following year. The English and provincial troops rendezvoused at the head of Lake George, went down that sheet of water, attacked Ticonderoga, and were repulsed with great loss. It was this portion of the campaign in which the soldiers served who kept the journal given in the succeeding pages. It is a graphic outline picture, in a few and simple words, of the daily life of a common soldier at that time. During the campaign of 1759, Quebec was captured by the army under Wolfe. Lord Amherst, more successful than Abercrombie, drove the French from Lake Champlain. Sir William Johnson captured Fort Niagara, and all Canada was in virtual possession of the English, except Montreal. That fell early in autumn of 1760, and the struggle for supremacy in America between the French and English was ended for ever. End of part two. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part three of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 3. Military Journal for 1758. April 5th, 1758. I, Lemuel Lyon, of Woodstock, enlisted under Captain David Holmes of Woodstock in New England for this present Canada expedition. Canada expedition. I received of Captain Holmes two pounds. May 30th. Received three pounds, 16 shillings. June 2nd. We arrived at Colonel Mason's at 12 o'clock, a march from there to Lannard Abbott's. Landlord. The proprietor of an inn or tavern was universally called landlord. The title is still very prevalent, and Sergeant Stone treated us there. Then we marched to Mansfield, to Deacon Eldridge, about four o'clock. Then we marched to Bolton, to Lannard Trills, 
and we gave seven pence a night for horse-keeping. Wednesday the 7th. We had carts to press. To take carts for the military service under martial law, any private property may be used for the public good. A just government always pays a fair price for the same. Then we marched on from there to Lannard Strengs in Hartford, and from there to Lannard Geds, and had raw pork for dinner. Then we marched to Lannard Cruz, and the chief lodges there. Probably General Lyman, who was the commander-in-chief of the Connecticut forces at that time. My mess lodged at a private house, one Daniel Catlin's. Thursday, 8th. Marched off and arrived at Lannard Gessels, and there we went to breakfast, and then we marched from there to our stores in Litchfield, in Litchfield County, Connecticut, to Squire Sheldings, and then to Lannard Buell's, and lodged there, and our captain was sent for, to a man in another company that had fits. Friday the 9th. Then marched from there, and we had new teams pressed there, and we arrived at Lannard Hollowbutts in Goshen, and from there to Widow Leggett's in Cornwall, Cornwall, and from there to Coles in Canaan, Canaan, and lodged there. Saturday 10th. Marched to Lawrence's, and from thence to Lannard Bushes in Sheffield, seven mile, and went to dinner. Thence marched and arrived at one Gant Burgess's, and lodged there, and our ensign went to prayer with us. Sunday 11th. Marched into the Patanoon lands, Livingston's Manor in Columbia County. The estates of Livingston, Van Ressenlaer, and others, who received grants of land from the government on certain conditions, in order to encourage immigration and agriculture, were called patroon lands, and the proprietors were entitled to patroons, or patrons, to Lannard Lovejoys, and went to dinner and had a hard shower, then marched into County Hook, Kinder Hook, to one Hayer Carnes, the stone house, and lodged there, and from thence to County Hook town, to one bushes, and slept there. Monday the 12th, at County Hook. Tuesday 13th, we marched and arrived at the halfway house in Albany and Baited, and then into Greenbush, now East Albany, on the west side of the Hudson River, by sundown, and lodged there in Ransley's barn. Wednesday the 14th, still at Albany, and there I first shifted my clothes and washed them. Then we had six rounds of powder and ball, and had orders from Colonel Whiting to go to Senecada, Shenecadi. This day, Asil Carpenter came to Albany. Thursday 15th. We went over the river early to receive our rations in provision and in money, and we marched two miles and stopped and refreshed ourselves. There half an hour, and Lieutenant Smith came up and we received our abelitin money. Billeting money, that is, money to pay for lodgings at a private house. When soldiers are quartered at private houses, it is said that such ones are billeted at such a house. Friday 16th. We had prayers in our company at three o'clock, and then all marched, but at fourteen they stayed here to guard Lieutenant Smith and the money, and yesterday Mr. Holmes sot of our home, and I give five pence for carrying my letter. We stayed here till five o'clock this afternoon, and we heard nothing from Lieutenant Smith, and we had no provisions, so we marched for Scanacata, Shenecadi, and we got in at sundown well, and there was a larum that night, a larum or alarm. Saturday 17th, still at Skinnacatta, Shenecadi, and we moved into our barracks, and Barnabas Evings was taken poor with a working in the body. Ben Denny was taken very poor. Sunday 18th, I was first called upon guard with fifteen more. My turn came first at eleven o'clock. This afternoon three o'clock Lieutenant Smith came up with our abolition money. Monday 19th, still at Skinnacatta and there was a regiment of province men, provincial troops or American soldiers. The English troops were called regulars. Come up to Skenacata, and this night twenty-five of our men went over the river west one mile to guard wagon horses. This day, a short training, one regiment. Tuesday 20th. There marched of three hundred of the Bay forces, Massachusetts Bay troops. The Massachusetts colony was called Massachusetts Bay until after the War of Independence. For Fort Edward. Fort Edward was situated upon the east bank of the Hudson, about fifty miles north of Albany. The fort was built by General Lyman of Connecticut 
in 1755, while that officer was encamped there with about 6,000 troops awaiting the arrival of General William Johnson, the commander-in-chief of the expedition against the French at Ticonderoga and Crown Point. A portion of the site of the fort is now, 1854, accompanied by the flourishing village of Fort Edward. Some of the embankments are yet visible near the river. It was near this fort that Jane McCree was killed and scalped in 1777 and I received my billetin in full. One pound eight shillings. Wednesday, 21st. Still here, and we were embodied for prayers in the morning, and then trained a little. Corporal Carpenter was taken poor. Thursday, 22nd. Had orders to march to the Half Moon, near Waterford, on the west side of the Hudson River, thirteen miles north from Albany, and Captain Lenness's company, two at seven o'clock. We marched and arrived at Tescoon, Niskayuna, a short distance from Waterford, and remarkable as a settlement of shaking Quakers, and lodged there at Lannard Abraham Groats. Friday 23rd. Marched in the rain, and very greasy travelling it was, and we arrived at Tiberth, and from thence to the place called Loudin's Ferry, on the Mohawk, about five miles above Coes Falls. It was the chief crossing place for troops on their way north from Albany. There the right wing of the American army under Arnold was encamped, while General Schuller was casting up the entrenchments at Coes Falls a few weeks before the Saratoga battles in 1777, to Lannard Fugdors, and from thence to Half Moon, and lodged there. Saturday 24th. I received a letter from John at the Half Moon, and from thence we marched and arrived at Stillwater. Stillwater is on the west bank of the Hudson in Saratoga County, 24 miles north from Albany. The Battle of Bemis Heights was fought there in 1777, and is sometimes known as the Battle of Stillwater. Opposite the mouth of the Hoosick River at Stillwater was a stockade called Fort Winslow, and lodged there, and Barnabas Evings was poor. End of Part 3 Recording by FNH Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk Part 4 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 4. Sunday 25th. We got two bateaus. A bateau is a kind of scow or flat boat used on shallow streams like the Hudson above Waterford to carry our packs up to Salatogue. Saratoga. This settlement was near the mouth of the Fish Creek on the south side. The village of Shulaville is just across the stream on the north side. On the plain in front of the village of Shulaville was a regular quadrangular fortification with bastions called Fort Hardy. It was erected in 1756 and named in honour of the governor of New York at that time. And we went afoot, and eight of our men were drawn out to stay at Satellogue. Captain Lewis shot at an Indian and killed him, and sot in bateau. From Salatogue we marched on to Fort Miller, on the west side of the Hudson, six or eight miles below Fort Edward. The river is there broken by swift rapids. During this campaign, Major, afterwards General Putnam, was here surprised by a party of Indians, and boldly descended the rapids in a canoe and escaped. It was a feat they never dared to attempt, and they felt certain that he was under the protection of the Great Spirit. Here a stream called Bloody Run enters the Hudson. It is so named because a party of soldiers from the garrison in 1759 went there to fish, were surprised by the Indians, and nine were killed and scalped, and lodged there. Monday 26th. Rainy and wet. I came up the river in a bateau to Fort Edward, to the encampment. There we drad half a pound of powder and ten bullets apiece, and eight days' provision in order to march to the lake. Lake George. Barnabas Evings was very poor with fever nago, fever and arg, and was forced to stay behind, and David Bishop with him. We lodged in bush tents, and very wet it was. Tuesday the 27th. 
marched all of Colonel Fitch's, Fitch's regiment that were here with three teams to carry the officers. We arrived at the halfway brook, afterward called Snook's Creek. It enters the Hudson three miles below Fort Edward. And there a great parcel stationed for a while, and thence we marched to Lake George, and went over upon the hill east, and there encamped. One with myself went upon guard this night. Wednesday the 28th. We cleared our ground and pitched our tents. I sent two letters home. Thursday the 29th. Still here. General Lyman. General Phineas Lyman, who built Fort Edward. He was a native of Durham, Connecticut, where he was born in 1716. He completed his education at Yale College and afterwards became an eminent lawyer. He was appointed commander-in-chief of the Connecticut forces in 1755, and in the expedition to Lake George deserved all of the honor awarded to General Johnson, who was jealous of Lyman's ability as a soldier. Lyman did his duty nobly, and was but little noticed. Johnson was unfit for his station, but being a nephew of Sir Peter Warren, then a popular English admiral, he received the honor of knighthood, and the sum of twenty thousand dollars for his services in that campaign. General Lyman served with distinction until the close of the campaign in 1760, and in 1762 commanded the American forces sent against Havana. He was in England about eleven years, and after his return went with his family to the Mississippi, where he died in 1788. And Colonel Fitch's regiment come up to the lake this day. I wash my clothes. One more regiment come up. Friday 30th. This day there was a very unhappy mishap fell out in province forces, and that was one shot one partly through the body, but did not kill him. The man which was shot lived at Bridgewater. Today they drawed out nine men to go in bateaux up the lake. Saturday, July 1st. Colonel Worcester. Colonel David Worcester, of Connecticut, the eminent general of the Revolution, who was killed at Ridgefield while engaged in the pursuit of Tyron after the burning of Danbury in the spring of 1777. He was born in Stratford, Connecticut, in March 1710, graduated at Yale College in 1738, and soon afterwards received the appointment of captain of a vessel in the Coast Guard. He was in the expedition against Louisburg in 1745. He afterward went to England, where he was a favourite at the court of King George II, and received the appointment of captain in the regular service under Sir William Pepperell. He was promoted to a colonelcy in 1755, and rose to the rank of brigadier before the close of the French and Indian War. He was one of the most active men in getting up the expedition against the Ticonderoga in 1775, which resulted in the capture of that fortress, and also Crown Point by Colonel Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold. Worcester was appointed one of the first brigadiers of the Continental Army in 1775, and third in rank. He was also appointed the first major general of the militia of his state when organized for the War for Independence and in that capacity he was employed with Arnold, Silliman, and others in repelling British invasion in 1777. He lost his life in that service. His remains were buried at Danbury, and in 1854 a monument was erected over his grave by his grateful countrymen at the expense of his native state. And his regiment came up today, and three of our sick men, one of them brought nurse, that one man shot another by accident at Shanakata, and an hour after he died. Today our chaplain, chaplain, came up. One of Major Rogers, commander of a corps of rangers, who performed signal services during the greater part of the French and Indian War. He was the son of an Irishman, an early settler of Dunbarton, in New Hampshire. He was appointed to his command in 1755, and was a thorough scout. In 1759 he was sent by General Amherst to destroy the Indian village of St. Francis. In that expedition he suffered great hardships, but was successful. He served in the Cherokee War in 1761, and in 1766 was appointed governor of Michili Mackinac, where he was accused of treason and sent to Montreal in irons. He was acquitted, went to England, and after suffering imprisonment for debt, returned to America where he remained until the revolution broke out. He took up arms for the king, and in 1777 went to England where he died. His journal of the French and Indian War is a valuable work men came in that had been gone seven days and expected to be gone but two he was so beat out that he could not tell what had become of t'other this night i went upon a bateau 
and guarded Colonel Fitch's tub of butter. Sunday 2nd In the forenoon I went to meeting, and heard Mr. Eels, his text, was in the fifth chapter of James, sixteenth verse, a good sermon. I wrote a letter, and sent home, and in the afternoon, to meeting again. Monday 3rd Yesterday, Major Putnam's S. Company came up, and this morning, Major Putnam, Israel Putnam, afterward the Revolutionary General. He was born in Salem, Massachusetts, in January 1718. He was a vigorous lad, and in 1739 we find him cultivating land in Pomfret, Connecticut, the scene of his remarkable adventure in a wolf's den, so familiar to every reader. He was appointed to the command of some of the first troops raised in Connecticut for the French and Indian War in 1755, and was an active officer during the entire period of that conflict, especially while in command of a corps of rangers. He was ploughing in his field when the news of the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord reached him. He immediately started for Boston, and at the head of the Connecticut troops was active in the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was one of the first four major generals of the Continental Army appointed by Congress in June 1775, and he was constantly on duty in important movements until 1779, when a partial paralysis of one side of his body disabled him for military service. He lived in retirement after the war, and died at Brooklyn, Wyndham County, Connecticut, on the 29th of May, 1790, at the age of 72 years. Came up, and the Connecticut's regiment were embodied for to learn how to form your front to the right and to the left, for General Abercromba, General James Abercrombie, the commander-in-chief of the campaign. He was descended from an ancient Scotch family, and because of signal services on the continent, was promoted to the rank of Major General, the military art having been his profession since boyhood. He was superseded by Lord Amherst after his defeat at Ticonderoga, and returned to England in the spring of 1759 and his aide-de-camp to view. Tuesday 4th. This day I cut my hat, and received my ammunition and provision for four days, and made ready for to go on. Wednesday 5th. This day the army, by sunrise, got ready for to march, and marched off by water, and arrived at the Sabbath day point. Sabbath day point. This is a fertile little promontory jutting out into Lake George from the western shore, a few miles from the little village of Hague, and surrounded by the most picturesque scenery imaginable. It was so named at this time, because it was early on Sunday morning that Abercrombie and his army left this place and proceeded down the lake. There a small provincial force had a desperate fight with the party of French and Indians, in 1756, and defeated them. Abercrombie's army went down the lake in bateau and whale boats, and reached the point just at dark. Captain, afterward General Stark, relates that he supped with the young Lord Howe that evening, at the point, and that the nobleman made many anxious inquiries about the strength of Ticonderoga, the country to be traversed, etc., and by his serious demeanour evinced a presentiment of his sad fate. He was killed in a skirmish with a French scout two days afterward. His body was conveyed to Albany in charge of Captain, afterward General, Philip Schuyler, and buried there. He was a brother of the admiral and general of that name, who commanded the British naval and land forces in America in 1776, and stayed there till midnight, then marched again to the first narrows, and landed there, and went down. Thursday 6th. Twelve o'clock at night we marched off again. The order of march, says Major Rogers, exhibited a splendid military show. There were 16,000 well-armed troops. Lord Howe, in a large boat, led the van of the flotilla, accompanied by a guard of rangers and expert boatmen. The regular troops occupied the centre, and the provincials the wings. The sky was clear and starry, and not a breeze ruffled the dark waters as they slept quietly in the shadows of the mountains. Their oars were muffled, and so silently did they move on, that not a scout upon the hills observed them. And the first intimation that the outposts of the enemy received of their approach was the full blaze of their scarlet uniforms, when, soon after sunrise, they landed and pushed on to award Ticonderoga, and landed at the first narrows, and then we marched on to the falls, rapids in the stream which forms the outlet of Lake George into Lake Champlain. Here are now extensive saw and grist mills. The distance from the foot of Lake George to Fort Ticonderoga is about four miles. Within two miles of the fort, 
and there we was attacked by the enemy. The English lacked suitable guides, and became bewildered in the dense forest that covered the land. Lord Howe was second in command, and led the van, preceded by Major Putnam and a scout of one hundred men, to reconnoitre. The French set fire to their own outpost, and retreated. Howe and Putnam dashed on through the woods, and in a few minutes fell in with the French advanced guard, who were also bewildered, and were trying to find their way to the fort. A smart skirmish ensued, and at the first fire Lord Howe, another officer, and several privates were killed. The French were repulsed, with the loss of about three hundred killed, and about one hundred and forty made prisoners. The English battalions were so much broken, confused, and fatigued, that Abercrombie ordered them back to the landing-place, where they bivouacked for the night. And the engagement held one hour, and we killed and took upwards of two and fifty. And of Captain Holmes' company, we had three men wounded. Sergeant Cader, Sergeant Armsper, and Ensign Robbins. And at sundown the French came out again, five thousand strong, and our men came back again to the landing-place, and lodged there. Friday 7th. Major Rogers went down to the mills, and drove them off therefrom, and killed and took upwards of a hundred and fifty, and at sundown the last of the army marched down to the mills, and Major Putnam made a bridge over by the landing-place. This night we lodged by the mills. Saturday 8th. Then marched back two or three regiments to the landing-place to guard, and help get up the artillery and we worked all the forenoon on loading the battoes. And at noon we set out down to the mills with the artillery, and we got near the mills, and we had orders to leave the artillery there. This was Abercrombie's fatal mistake. He sent an engineer to reconnoitre the fort and outworks. The engineer reported the latter to be so weak in an unfinished state as to be easily carried without artillery by the forces of English bayonets. The difficulties in the way of heavy cannons in that dense forest were very formidable, and Adber Crombie was willing to rely upon sword and bayonet on the strength of his engineer's report. That functionary was mistaken, and when the English approached the French lines, they found an embankment of earth and stones eight feet in height, strongly guarded by abatis or felled trees with their tops outward. The English made a furious attack, cut pathways through these prostrate trees, and mounted the parapet. They were instantly slain, and thus scores of Britons were sacrificed by discharges of heavy cannons. When two thousand men had fallen, Abercrombie sounded a retreat, and the whole British army made its way to the landing-place at the foot of Lake George, with a loss of twenty-five hundred muskets. They went up the lake to Fort William Henry, and the wounded were sent to Fort Edward, and to Albany. At his own solicitation, Colonel Bradstreet was sent to attack the French fort Frontenac, where Kingston now stands, at the foot of Lake Ontario, and General Stanwix proceeded to erect a fort towards the headwaters of the Mohawk, where the village of Rome now flourishes, and go back and get our arms, and we went down to the mills of our regiment, two hundred were ordered to go over onto the point to keep the French from landing there, and we stayed, while next morning sun two hours high, and when we came in, all our army and artillery was gone back, and the mills fired and we marched back to the landing-place, and had to secure the matter of two hundred barrels of flour. And we heard the French were a-coming upon us, and we strove them all, and come of us as soon as we could, and about ten o'clock we got sail, and by sundown we arrived at Lake George. The head of the lake was especially designated as Lake George. There was the dilapidated Fort William Henry built by Sir William Johnson in the autumn of 1755, and about half a mile southeast from it, Fort George was afterward erected. The ruins of its citadel may yet, 1854, be seen. According to all accounts, the engagement began about ten o'clock, and held ten hours steady, and we lost three thousand regulars. End of Part 4 Recording by FNH Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk Part 5 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. 
The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 5. Monday 10th. Still at Lake George, in our old encampment. Two cannon and two mortar pieces, all of them brass, come into Lake George today. Tuesday the 11th. I washed my clothes today and had tea for breakfast. Wednesday 12th. Today I was called upon guard. Stephen Lyon went to Fort Edward. Thursday 13th. Today washed my clothes. Friday 14th. Nothing remarkable. Saturday 15th. Nothing remarkable. Called out to work. Sunday 16th. Went to meeting to hear Mr. Pomeroy, Pomeroy, and his text was in the 16th chapter of Isaiah, the ninth verse. In the afternoon, went to hear Mr. Eels, and his text was in the 4th chapter of Amos, and the 12th verse. Sung the 45th Psalm, the last time sung the 44th Psalm. This day Colonel Deutner's regiment marched off. Monday 17th. This day, Sergeant Joseph Mathers had a new shirt put on, of seventy stripes. Flogging was facetiously termed putting on a new shirt. Seventy lashes was a pretty severe punishment. I washed, and at night was called upon picket guard. Barney went down to the halfway brook. This was the outlet of three little lakes, situated about halfway between the head of Lake George and the bend of the Hudson at Sandy Hill. They are the headwaters of Clear River, the west branch of Wood Creek, which empties into Lake Champlain at Whitehall and back again to guard artillery. Tuesday 18th. One Samuel Johnson died very suddenly. He belonged to Captain Latimer's company of New Cannon. Nehemiah Blackmore was whipped ten stripes for firing his gun. Wednesday 19th. This day, to work upon the hospital, getting timber to it. I went upon the island. This was the Diamond Island, lying directly in front of Dunham's Bay, and not far from the village of Caldwell. It was so called because of the number and beauty of quartz crystals found upon it. Burgoyne made it a depot of military stores when on his way from Canada by the way of Lake Champlain in 1777. It was the scene of a sharp conflict between the little garrison and a party of Americans under Colonel Brown on the 25th of September 1777. While Gates and Burgoyne were confronted at Saratoga, Brown was repulsed to stay there a week. Thursday 20th. Still at work. Colonel Worcester sought out to go down to Albany and a number of men with him. This morning ten men were a-going to the halfway brook to guard the post, and the Indians waylaid them, and killed nine of them. And one got in safe, and they rallied out from the brook one hundred, and went back to see what was the matter, and they laid wait for them, and they fired upon the front first, and killed two captains and two lieutenants on the spot and our men were surprised, and run back all but a few, and they stood a little while, and lost seventeen men. The engagement began, some two hours high. About an hour after Lieutenant Smith and two hundred of our men went down to help guard the teams down to Fort Edward. Friday 21st. This day, at night, Lieutenant Smith came back, and very poor he was. The rest of the guard returned well. Saturday 22nd. This day Colonel Partridge's regiment, Partridge's, was resolved to have their full allowance or go off, and they got it. They were volunteers. A small shower, and at night our post came in, and our men that stayed behind came up, and I received a letter from home. Sunday 23rd. Went to meeting, and the text was in the three chapter of John, and the sixteen verse, and in the afternoon the text was in the sixth chapter of Micah and six and seven verses. This day, wet and hard showers. Monday 24th. This day, a week ago, Ensign Robbins died at Albany. This day, Henry Morris came up to Lake George with two wagon loads of rum and sold it right off. Tuesday 25th. Captain Holmes and five of our men went down to the halfway brook to be stationed there till further orders. At nine o'clock, one James McMahon, Maman, was hanged upon the gallows, upon the top of the rock and noose. This locality cannot be identified. Our post came in, and I was released from the hospital work. Wednesday 26th. 
Major Putnam, had orders to list four hundred rangers, and listed some to-day. Thursday, 27th. This day, the captains of the companies drawed out nine men of a company for rangers. Friday, 28th. There was about forty teams and wagons are coming up, about halfway between Fort Edward and halfway Brook, and a scout of French and Indians waylaid them and killed every ox and destroyed all their stores, everything. Rogers, in his journal, speaks of this occurrence. He says it was on the 27th, and that 116 men were killed, of whom 16 were rangers. And about midnight our camps were alarmed of it, and Major Putnam rallied about 1,000 men and went after them. Saturday 29th. This day Rogers went upon the track with his rangers. He went out with 700 men to intercept the marauding party, but they escaped, and sent back for all the picket guard, and they went this day. I was very poor, and took a portion of physic. Sunday 30th. This morning, by break of day, some of Major Putnam's men that he left with the battoes spied some more coming down the lake, and they come, and told, and Lyman rallied about two thousand men, and went up the lake. I was poor, and went to meeting. Mr. Ingerson, Ingersoll, preached, and his text was in the Psalms, the 83, and the 14 and 15. The afternoon, the text was in Deuteronomy, 32 and 29 verse. End of part five. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part six of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part six. Monday, 31st. Nine of our New England men were put under guard for making false larame about the bateaux coming down upon us, and also one regular that Rogers took that deserted last year to the French from us. Tuesday, August 1st. There was about 700 men went down to the halfway brook to be stationed there, and eight of our company and Captain Holmes came back. Wednesday, 2. Today, General Limon, in of a scout, and the men that went with him, and Rogers and Putnam, went out of a scout, with fourteen or fifteen hundred, for ten days. Rogers says that on his return from his attempt to intercept the marauding party, he was met by an express with orders to march towards the head of Lake Champlain, at the south and east bays, to prevent the French marching upon Fort Edward. There he was joined by Major Putnam, and Captain Dayel, or Diel. This day Kraft died, and was buried. Stephen Lyon came of scout. Thursday 3rd. Two of our men went out a-fishing for two days, but had poor luck. Friday 4th. We had our orders to march to Fort Edward, and I washed up my clothes. Saturday 5th. This morning about half our regiment marched forward to build breastworks along upon the road in some bad places. We arrived at Fort Edward at nine o'clock, and we built two breastworks. Sunday 6th. We draw three days' provision, and this afternoon the rest of our regiment came down, and the teams that went up the day before. We received our passage packet of letters from home. Monday 7th. Catman and all that were able to go were ordered to guard down to Fort Miller and back again. Tuesday 8th. In the morning we were drawed out for work, and work the forenoon, and then we were ordered to fix every man in the regiments to make ready, to go out to help Major Putnam and we met them a-coming in from sundown, and we helped them along as far as we could, and that night, and lay out that night, and three of the wounded men died there, and Ben Denny for one. A severe engagement took place on Clear River, the west branch of Wood Creek, about a mile northwest from Fort Ann village, then the site of a picketed blockhouse called Fort Ann. Between a party of rangers and provincials under Rogers Putnam and Captain Daliel, or Diel, and about an equal number of French and Indians under Molang, a famous partisan leader. 
the English troops were marching when attacked, Putnam was in front, with the provincials, Rogers was in the rear with his rangers, and Diel was in the centre, with the regulars. Molang attacked them in front, and a powerful Indian rushed forward and made Putnam a prisoner. The provincials were thrown into great confusion, but were rallied by Lieutenant Durkey, who was one of the victims of the Wyoming massacre twenty years afterward. Diel, with Gage's light infantry, behaved very gallantly, and the rangers finally put the enemy to flight. The latter lost about two hundred men. Colonel Prevost, then in command at Fort Edward, sent out three hundred men with refreshments for the party, and all arrived at Fort Edward on the ninth. This was the relief party mentioned in the text, under date of the eighth. Wednesday ninth. We got in about eight o'clock, and buried the dead, and the wounded were dressed and carried over on the island. This is an island in the Hudson, opposite Fort Edward, and known as Rogers Island. Powers came up with a load of settlers, sutlers, stores, and treated us well. Thursday 10th, I was called out to work upon the block house. This day our post went of home with our letters. Friday 11th, we went up to guard teams to Halfway Brook, and to build a breastwork, 36 ox teams and 6 wagons. Saturday 12th, Colonel Fitch, Fitch had a letter from Major Putnam at Tyantariogue, Ticonderoga. He is taken prisoner. The Indian who seized Putnam tied him to a tree, and for a time he was exposed to the cross-fire of the combatants. His garments were riddled by bullets, but, strange to say, not one touched his person. He was carried away in the retreat, his wrists tightly bound with cords. The Indians rejoiced over the capture of their great enemy, and he was doomed to the torture. In the deep forest he was stripped naked, bound to a sapling, wood was piled high around him, the death songs of the savages were chanted, and the torch was applied. Just then a heavy shower of rain almost extinguished the flames. They were again bursting forth with fiercer intensity when a French officer, informed of what was going on, darted through the crowd of yelling savages and released the prisoner. He was delivered to Montcalm at Ticonderoga, then sent to Montreal, and, after being treated kindly, was exchanged for a prisoner taken by Colonel Bradstreet at Frontenac. Sunday 13th Day the chief of our men upon duty, and the rest went to meeting the afternoon. The text was in the second of Timothy, and first chapter, and tenth verse. Monday 14th I had nothing to do. I wrote a letter to John. Tuesday 15th I was upon picket, picket, guard, and wet and stormy it was. One of the regulars whipped for sleeping upon guard. Wednesday 16th the rangers discovered a scout of French, and come in to Fort Edward, and all that were able were ready at a minute's warning. Today I sent a letter to John Lyon. Thursday 17th. W. P. 31 stripes still, and nothing to do the leave. T. S. fixed up their tents. Friday 18th. Six of our men were ordered to go over to work upon the blockhouse over the river. I was really tired at night. Saturday 19th. I wash my clothes. Col Fitch at Salatogue. Sunday 20th. We were almost all out upon duty to work at the highways, and in the afternoon a very hard shower, which sot our tents all afloat. Monday 21st. I went down to Fort Misery. Fort Misery was a breastwork at the mouth of Moses Kill, or Creek, a short distance from Fort Miller, on the east side of the Hudson and I heard of John Day's death at Salatogue. This day Morris came up, and we lived well. Tuesday 22nd. I went up the river to look for a horse. Stephen and I was called upon picket guard. Wednesday 23rd. I went out to look oxen, and was treated well. One man's gun went off, and cut off his finger. We drove out the two men out of the blockhouse, kept the great cattle. Thursday 24th, I was called out to guard up teams, and to work on the road, and had Jill of rum for it. Zachariah Catlin died at Fort Edward. Friday 25th, I was called upon the quarter guard, and we heard the great guns that were fired at the lake, at Fort George, at the head of Lake George. They shot at a mark, and our provincials beat them, and it made them very mad. Saturday 26th, David Lyon and Barnes sought out to Albany sick this day, 
They held a regimental court-martial upon three deserters of Captain Mather's company, one William Kennedy and William Clearmont, were judged to have one thousand lashes, and today received two hundred and fifty stripes apiece. T'other was forgiven. Sunday, 27th. I was out upon the works at the great blockhouse. We were out of provision. We drawed for seven days, but four gone, so the regulars shot pigeons, and our men did so too. End of part six. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 7 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775 by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 7. Monday, 28th. Every private in our company was out upon duty that was able. And about four o'clock we came in, and the orders were that every man should make ready to fire three valleys, volleys. And first they fired the cannon at the fort, one after t'other round, the fort which is twenty-one, then the small arms, and so three rounds apiece, and then made a great fire on the parade, and played round it, and one gill of rum a man allowed for the frolic, and a barrel of beer for a company. It was the king's birthday. The firing of twenty-one heavy guns formed a royal salute. And a very wet night. Tuesday, twenty-ninth. Very wet in the morning, then cleared of cold. I went upon duty and sent a letter home. Friday, September ye first. Our duty was to help get out the cannon out of the bottom of the river that was dropped in by means of going too near the end of the brig, bridge, and sunk the scows and drowned one ox. Very cold work. A woman whipped seventy stripes and drummed out of the camp. Saturday 2nd. I was called upon the picket guard today. Last night I went down to Fort Miskita. Fort Mosquito was a breastwork cast up at the mouth of Snook's Creek, and Smith Ainsworth treated us well. Sunday 3rd. I was out upon the escort, and every man upon some duty. I went to meeting part of the forenoon, and the text was in Acts 24 and 25. Charles Rippler was put in Ensign. Monday 4th. Our post sot of home. I went down to Fort Miskator to guard teams, and the post, and the lobsters. This was a nickname for the regular troops, who were dressed in scarlet uniforms. And our men hopped and wrestled, wrestled together to see which would beat, and our men beat. Tuesday 5th. Still, and nothing strange. Wednesday 6th. Most all of our men upon duty. I was to work a making a road to go up to the great blockhouse. Thursday 7th. All our men out upon works guarding teams, and a great number of them nigh one hundred. And when we came back, there was a scout coming from Fort Edward, that went out from the lake they discovered nothing. Friday 8th. This day, Sergeant Earls went out to Fort Anne. Fort Anne was erected in 1757, a year before the occurrence here narrated took place. It was a strong blockhouse of logs, with portholes for cannon and loopholes for musketry, and surrounded by a picket of pine saplings. When the writer visited the spot in 1848, he dug up a part of one of the pickets yet remaining in the earth, and, on splitting it, it emitted the pleasant odour of a fresh pine log though ninety years had elapsed since it was placed there. This fort was near the bank of Wood Creek, about eleven miles from the head of Lake Champlain, at the village of Whitehall. It was in the line of Burgoyne's march towards the Hudson in 1777, and near it quite a severe skirmish took place between Colonel Long of Schuler's army and a British detachment under Colonel Hill, on the 8th of July, the day after Ticonderoga was abandoned to the enemy. Victory was almost within the grasp of Colonel Long when his ammunition failed, and he was compelled to retreat. After the Colonel, Canoe, Lieutenant Lannard, and Ephraim Ellinghoodnap, and John Ryerson, and Jeb Brooks, 
and Hezekiah Carpenter, they six of our company, forty in all, went along. I went to work at the highway, and had half a pint of rum for it. Saturday ninth, I was warned a quarter guard, and I changed with Moses Peak, and went upon escort, and got in by twelve o'clock. I was warned out to work, but did not do much. Sergeant Earls came in with his colonel, and the general was much pleased with it. Sunday ten, I was upon guard, but went to meeting a part of the forenoon, and the text was in twenty-four of Acts and twenty-five verse, and the afternoon the text was in James the sixth and twelfth verse. Monday eleven, I took four days' provisions and Josh Barrett and one ranger with me, and we went out near Fort Anne, and we spied a fire and some person, and we come back and made our report to the general and he blamed us some, and said we should have a new pilot and go again. Joe Downer put under guard. Tuesday 12th. I was freed from duty, and we went and split out some plank to do up our tent. Wednesday 13th. To work in the fort and wheeling gravel all day. Four regulars whipped in fort, some for gaming, and one for being absent after being warned upon guard. Thursday 14th. I was warned on escort down to Misery, Fort Misery, and flanked all day Tuesday. Twelve at night, there was two bonfires and two barrels of rum allowed for the rejoicing of broad streets taking Katarukrai, the Indian name of the site of Fort Frontenac, where Kingston, Upper Canada now stands, taken by Colonel Bradstreet, was Cataraca. That was also the Indian name for Lake Ontario. Friday 15th. Day I was to work over upon island and worked hard a shovel in dirt, and see Ephraim Ellinghood taken poorly. Saturday 16th, day I went to cutting fascines, fascines, bundles of sticks mixed with earth, and used for filling ditches in the construction of forts, and stented, four apiece in half a day, and twelve stakes. Sunday 17th, all our men upon works, Mr. Pomery, Pomeroy, preached one sermon, and his text in James chapter 5th, and twelve verse. Stephen Child had a post to Albany, and sought out this day one regular come in that was a fishing at Halfway Brook. Monday 18th. I was to work over to the block house, and took my farewell of working there, and all our sick were drawed up, and some discharged. Tuesday 19th. Four of our company had a final discharge from the campaign, and sot off home Seth Bassett, Jonathan Corbin, John Peake, and Silas Hodges. Wednesday 20th. Still here the main of us, and nothing remarkable, only almost all our Woodstock men came up, and with great joy we received them, and much more the things that were sent us. I received a letter from Ben Lyon. Thursday 21st. Nothing remarkable this day. Friday 22nd. Our Woodstock old militia, militia, sought out home, and Lieutenant Smith and Corporal Peake and William Mercy and Samuel Levins had passed to Albany, and went with them along down, and many more that did not belong to our company. Saturday 23. Our post came up, and I received a letter from home. Sunday 24th. Mr. Pomery, Pomeroy, preached one sermon in the middle of the day, so that the workmen might have some opportunity to hear some his text, was in Ezekiel, the thirty-seven chapter, and thirty-six verse. I was to work upon the island, and I heard part of the sermon. The channel between Rogers Island, on which the great block house was built, and Fort Edward, does not exceed two hundred feet in width. Monday 25. Nothing remarkable. Only Stephen Lyon got hurt, Samuel Morris and Chubb went down along to Albany. Tuesday 26th. One scout went out for three days this day. A great number of teams came down from the lake. Wednesday 27th. The Thompson men that came up to see us sought out along New England, and Sergeant Cromber had a pass to Albany and went down along. Thursday 28th. Nothing remarkable. Only the scout came in that went out for three days. Friday 29th. Nothing remarkable. Only very long orders. End of part seven. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk.
Part 8 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 8. Saturday 30th. Nothing remarkable only the christening christening of the royal blockhouse and the whole of our regiment that were able went over to work and had a good frolic to drink the men in general worked well at the entrenching round the blockhouse the trench three foot deep sunday october ye first nothing remarkable but something very strange and that is the camps were still and no work going forward nor no prayers nor no sermon and a gill of rum into the bargain this we had from the generals, our month promised to us yesterday. Mr. Pomery went down to Saratoga to see his son that was sick, and today he came back, etc. Monday ye second. All the regiment that were able to work went over to the blockhouse besides that was upon guard, and they were divided into four parties, and they that got done first was to have the best fat sheep, one sheep to each party. I was upon the grass guard and at night I found it very tedious lying out, for it stormed exceeding hard all night. Tuesday ye third. Our mess being all of duty, we made up two straw bunks for four of us to lay in, and as it happened we did it in good time, for it was very cold night. Wednesday ye fourth. Being very cold, Corporal Sanger and Eliza Child had a pass down to Albany, and likewise a small scout went for number four, and we made our chimney. Sergeant Kimball was broke and turned into ranks. Thursday 5th. General Ambros, General Amherst, arrived at Fort Edward about twelve o'clock, and immediately he went off to the lake. Nothing more remarkable today. Friday 6th. Henry Lyon and Ephraim Ellinghood, poorly, and cleared from duty three men, whipped about three hundred lashes apiece, and one woman, two and fifty lashes on bare rump. Saturday, 7th. Our picket went up toward the halfway brook to meet General Ambros, Amherst, and about three o'clock he arrived at Fort Edward, and at two o'clock the picket went down with him again and his wagon and six horses. Sunday, 8. In the forenoon, all our men upon works. In the afternoon, we were allowed to attend meeting, and Mr. Pommy, Pomeroy, preached one sermon, and his text was in Ezekiel 36 and 37 verse. Our family this day had a great rarity for dinner, and that was a billed puddin. Monday 9. Nothing remarkable among us this day. Tuesday 10. I was upon guard, and a very stormy day and night it was. Orders came out strict that all fires should be put out by eight of the clock in the morning, and not to have no more till six at night and they that don't obey the orders are to have their chimney tore down, and not to have another during this campaign. Colonel Fitch lost a barrel of wine. Wednesday 11th. Still warm and wet. Some of our regiment discharged home, but none of our company. Thursday 12th. A very clear, cold morning. All our men upon works and upon guard that were able. Colonel Hart's regiment of the Hampshire marched down to Fort Edward in order for home. Friday 13th. All our men upon works again today. Three discharged viz. Richard Jordan, Stephen Lyon, and John Howlett. At night three hundred of the bay men came down sick, and two of them that carried their packs died in the night. Saturday 14th. All worn out upon works, but the stormy weather defeated them in it, and the regulars which came down from the lake with us have orders to march next Friday down along in order for their winter quarters at Halifax. Halifax, Nova Scotia. This night, the sentry which stood at the southern of the storehouse spied a man getting a flower, and he hailed him three times, but he would not stop, and the sentry fired, but did not hit him, and in his hurry he left his Tommy Hawk, Tomahawk, and one shoe. Sunday, ye fifteen very cold. All upon works and guard by sunrise. This evening there came in a great number of teams, 
and Samuel Peake brought the melancholy news of Stephen Childs being killed and sculped, scalped, and another captivated. I was out upon grass guard. Monday, 16th. All upon works, and all the teams sot off for the lake. Twelve men taken from the quarter guard to guard teams. This evening there came in a great number of wagons, and hundred or better. Tuesday, 17th. Being very pleasant in the morning, then showery and wet all the rest of the day, till ten o'clock at night. About twelve o'clock at night, the teams came in with the artillery. This day, a number of our men went down to Fort Miller in Batos, to carry the sick, and Captain's bag went down, and the men stayed out. Wednesday, 18th. Being cold, the teams sot out for the lake, about forty of the king's wagons. This afternoon, there was a lobster British regular corporal married to a Rhode Island whore. Our men came in from Fort Miller. Thursday, 19th. Our regiment was mustered by nine o'clock in the morning, and our brigade major called over the roll of each company, and after that we had a drink of flip, a mixture of beer and rum, warmed by thrusting a hot iron into it, for working over at the Royal Block House. At one of the clock, our men were all called to work. A court marshal was called at Captain Holmes' tent, and Captain Holmes' president, and at the roll of the picket guard was there one Isaac Ellis, whipped thirty stripes, was to had fifty. Colonel Henman's Hinman's men came in, loaded with artillery stores. Friday 20th, cold still, and our men all upon works. This afternoon, Lieutenant Smith came up to us again from Greenbush, and Shovel Child came to his team. Saturday ye 21st, still cold. In the morning our men called out to work by sunrise, and before and six of our company, viz. David Bishop, Ephraim Ellingwood, Samuel Mercy, Nathaniel Abbott, David Jewett, and Drake, marched with their packs. This night there came down a great number of teams from ye lake, here loaded with cannonballs and bum-shells. Likewise, a number of sick came down. Sunday 22. The teams set out for ye lake again. I was upon the quarter guard. A large number of sick sought out for home, and it yet held cold, and at night it cleared of very clear, and still. But very fresh in cold, a black frost. Monday ye 23rd. I come of guard. Clark Burroughs began his month with Bess. At night three regiments of province men came down from ye lake, and lodged in the wood near the upper block house. A number of teams came down from ye lake, loaded with artillery stores. End of part eight. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part nine of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775 by Abraham Tomlinson. Part nine. Tuesday 24th. A number of teams started for ye lake again. I received two letters from Captain Benjamin Lyon, and one from Joshua. The post came up yesterday to Fort Edward. This day our drawing, and we had good pork. Three regiments of baymen moved down along which was Colonel Pribbles, Pribbles, Colonel Williams, and Colonel Nichols. Wednesday 25th. General Abercrumba arrived at Fort Edward near night and all our regiment there were of duty were ordered to be out upon the parade with their side arms on but the general forbid it colonel l partridge's regiment came down and some of the lather caps and stayed here thursday ye twenty sixth stormy morning snow pretty wet and raw cold i went upon the picket last night and had one quart of rum for keeping sheep friday twenty seventh being lowry and wet, one of our men discharged home, and sot of Nathaniel Barnes a number of teams sot out for the brook, and returned again before sundown. Saturday, 28th. Being still cold, all our men turned out to work sunrise. 
and that want enough, and they sent for every waiter, waiter, and every one that belongs to the regiment. A number of teams sought out down home ward, and three of our company went with them, viz. Surgeon Amsborough, Jonathan Child, and Payne Convis. This afternoon the orders came out that every settler, subtler, that belongs to the provincials should quit this place by the 1st of November. Sunday, ye 29th. Ranny and wet. About nine o'clock in the morning, every man in the regiment that could go went to the falls, the third fall, as it was called, in the Hudson, at Sandy Hill, to help draw down the bateaux, and very muddy it was. Monday, ye 30th. Being very pleasant in the morning, we were all turned out after bateaux up to the falls, and we went twice apiece. Tuesday, ye 31st. All our men turned out by the Rivalis, Rivelli, beating to go to Bateau's, and General Provost, Provost, was out amongst our tents to help turn us out, and he said it was the last work we should do that was flung up today. I went upon the quarter guard at noon, and they got down all the Bateau's. Wednesday, November, ye 1st. Lowry and wet. I come of guard, our men all upon works, and three regiments of our Connecticut's came down about noon, and Colonel Whiting's had orders to go over to the Royal Blockhouse, and there to remain until further orders, and t'other two regiments sot off home in bateaux, and two or three regiments of lobsters. We had orders come out that we should all have two days to clean up in, and to set for home on Sunday. This day I wrote a letter, and sent to John. Thursday ye second. Very cold. Our men turned out to cutting for sheens, and the orders were that it was the last day's work that we should do. Friday, ye third. Very cold. Our men all turned out upon works, notwithstanding yesterday's promise. Our men had but poor encouragements to work, and laid but little weight to what that general promised, for he said the first man that disobeyed his orders again should be shot to death, whatsoever soldier or officer. Saturday 4th. I was orderly after general, and our men all to work a drawing in cannon into the fort, and our quarter guard was not relieved till afternoon, and after that orders come out that we should strike our tents by eight o'clock and be ready to march by nine. One symbols got his discharge from the regular service today. Sunday ye fifth. Being very cold, it began to rain, so that we were detained, but Colonel Whiting marched off. Rainy all day long. We had orders to be ready to march at seven o'clock in the morning. Monday ye sixth. Cloudy still. At eight o'clock we struck our tents, and at nine o'clock we marched off, and about half after twelve we arrived at Fort Miller, and made a little stop, then marched again, and arrived at Saratoga, sun about one hour high, and made no stop there, but marched on about three mile, and encamped in the woods. Friday, ye tenth. Very stormy, and snow in the morning. We drawed two days' allowance of provisions, but no money, and about two o'clock we sought out from Greenbush, and arrived at Cantyhook Town, about ten o'clock at night, thirteen of us, and Lieutenant Lannard. Saturday, eleventh. From thence we marched sun two hours high, and arrived at John Hugger Booms, Hodge Booms, and revived ourselves a little, and brought some rum that belonged to Colonel Whitten's regiment, and thence to Lovejoy's, and went to supper, and from thence to Robus's, and lodged there in the Pataroom lands. Livingston's Manor in Columbia County. The estates of Livingston, Van Ressenlayer, and others, who received grants of land from the government, on certain conditions, in order to encourage immigration and agriculture, were called patroon lands, and the proprietors were entitled to patroons, or patrons. Sunday 12th. Being still cold, we sought out at sunrise, and arrived at Bushes in Sheffield, and had a good breakfast, and there was more with horses, and from thence to Lawrence's, and revived ourselves there, to Coles, and thence to Sedgwick in Cornwell, and then to Wilcox in Goshen, and lodged there. Monday, 13th. Cold. I come up to Hollyboat, and sent my pack along from Goshen, 
and we march and arrive at Litchfield, and then to Herrintown to Weirs, and from there to Strong's in Farmington, and lodge there. Tuesday 14th. Very cold and frosty. Marched five mile through the meadows, and went to breakfast, and come to Mercy's, and stayed there, and Captain Holmes came up. Wednesday 15th. We marched and arrived at Cheney's in Bolton, and from thence we marched and arrived at Lee's in Coventry, Coventry, and lodged there. Very rainy. Stephen Lyon met us with the horses. Thursday 16th. Being warm and pleasant, we arrived at Woodstock. Note. The soldiers had necessarily a great deal of leisure during permanent camp duties, and contrived various ways to amuse themselves and kill time. In those days the common soldiers carried their powder in horns of cows or oxen, and many amused themselves by ornamenting them by a skilful use of their knives. Below is a specimen of one of these ornamented horns, prepared during the campaign of 1758. Upon it is neatly cut the figure of a fortified building, a part of which is seen in the engraving. The owner's name and a verse as follows. Eleuthan Ives, his horn, made at Lake George, September ye 22nd, A.D. 1758. I, powder with my brother Ball, a hero like do conquer all, steal not this horn for fear of shame, for on it is the owner's name. The ruse is red, the grass is green, the days are past, which I have seen. End of part nine. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part ten of the military journals of two private soldiers, 1758 to 1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F and H. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 10. A Journal for 1775 A.D. Introductory Remarks. The following is a literal transcript of a journal kept by a common soldier named Samuel Hawes, of Wrentham, Massachusetts, who appears to have been one of the Minutemen organized towards the close of 1774 and early in 1775. At that time there were about 3,000 British troops in Boston under General Thomas Gage, who was also governor of the colony of Massachusetts. He was popularly regarded as an oppressor and act after act of the British government during a year preceding had convinced the American people that they must choose the alternative to submit or fight. They resolved to fight, if necessary. During the summer of 1774, the people commenced arming and training themselves in military exercises. The manufacture of arms and gunpowder was encouraged, and throughout Massachusetts in particular, the people were enrolled in companies and prepared to take up arms at a moment's warning. From this circumstance, they were called Minutemen. With his strong force, Gage felt quite certain that he could suppress the threatened insurrection and keep the people quiet. Yet he felt uneasy concerning the gathering of ammunition and stores by the Patriots at Concord, 16 miles from Boston. And on the night of the 18th of April, 1775, he sent a detachment of soldiers to seize them. They proceeded by way of Lexington, where they arrived at dawn on the 19th. The expedition became known, and the country was aroused. When the British approached Lexington, they were confronted by about 70 Minutemen. A skirmish ensued. Eight Patriots were killed, and several were wounded. That was the first bloodshed of the Revolution. The British then went on to Concord to seize the stores, where they were again confronted by Minutemen. Indeed, they had been annoyed all the way by them, as they fired from behind buildings, stone walls, and trees. They destroyed the stores, and in a skirmish killed several more American citizens. The country was now thoroughly aroused, and the Minutemen hastened towards Lexington and Concord from all directions. The British found it necessary to retreat, and nothing save the whole troops sent out from the night before from utter destruction, but a strong reinforcement under Lord Percy. 
the whole body retreated hastily to Charleston, and across to Boston with a loss in killed and wounded of 273 men. Intelligence of the tragedy soon spread over the country, and from the hills and valleys of New England thousands of men armed and unarmed hastened towards Boston, and formed that force of which our journalist was one, that for nine months kept the British army prisoners upon the peninsulas of Boston and Charleston. By common consent, Artemus Ward, a soldier of the French and Indian War, was made commander-in-chief, and he performed the duties of that office with zeal until he was superseded by Washington early in July 1775. A Journal for 1775 Illustration A Journal for 1775 in Rentham, April the 19th, Samuel Hawes, facsimile of a portion of the manuscript journal. Rentham in Norfolk County, Massachusetts, 32 miles southwest from Boston. April the 19th. About one o'clock, the Minutemen, see introductory remarks. The skirmishes at Lexington and Concord occurred early in the morning of this day. Were alarmed and met at Landlord Moons. We marched from there, the sun about half an hour high towards Roxbury, for we heard that the regulars had gone out and had killed six men and had wounded some more. That was at Lexington. Then the King's troops proceeded to Concord, and there they were defeated and drove back, fitting as they went, that gat to Charleston Hill that night. See introductory remarks. We marched to Heddens at Walpole, twenty-one miles from Boston, and there got a little refreshment, and from there we marched to Dr. Cheney's, and there we got some victuals and drink, from thence we marched to Landlord Clisses at Dedham, thirteen miles from Boston. And there Captain Parsons and company joined us, and then we marched to Jay's, and there Captain Boyd and company joined us. And we marched to Landlord Whitting's. We tarried there about one hour, and then we marched to Richard's, and searched the house, and found Ebenezer Aldis, and one Perry, who we supposed to be Tories. And we searched them, and found several letters about them, which they were a-going to carry to Nathan Aldis in Boston. But making them promise reformation, we let them go home. Then, marching forward, we met Colonel Grattan, Colonel John Grayton. He was a bold officer, and commanded a corps which performed a sort of ranger service. At this time he was only a major. In June following, he carried off about eight hundred sheep and lambs, and some cattle from Deer Island. About that time he was promoted to the rank of Colonel. In the middle of July, he led one hundred and thirty-six men in whale-boats to destroy forage and other property on Long Island, in Boston Harbour, and at one time he captured a barge belonging to a British man-of-war. In April 1776 he accompanied General Thompson to Canada. He was promoted to the rank of brigadier in the Continental Army in January 1783, returning from the engagement, which was the day before, and he said that he would be with us immediately. Then we marched to Jamakai Plain, Jamaica Plain, six miles from Boston. There we heard that the regulars were a-coming over the neck, the isthmus that connected the peninsula of Boston with the main at Roxbury. And we stripped of our coats, and marched on with good courage to Colonel Williams, and there we heard to the contrary. We stayed there some time, and refreshed ourselves, and then marched to Roxbury Parade, and there we had as much liquor as we wanted, and every man drawed three biscuit which were taken from the regulars. The British soldiers were all called regulars. This word denotes soldiers belonging to the regular army, as distinguished from militia, the day before, which were hard enough for flints. We lay on our arms until towards night, and then we repaired to Mr. Slack's house, and at night six men were drafted out for the main guard. Nothing strange that night. D-21 Nothing remarkable this day. D-22 Nothing strange this D, nor comical. D-23. Being Sabbath day, we marched on to the parade. There was an alarm this night, but it proved to be a false one. Some of our men went to Weymouth, twelve miles southeast from Boston. D-24. Nothing strange today. D-25. Nothing remarkable today. D-26. We were guarded, and a party drafted out for the main guard. D-27. The enlistment came out to enlist men for the Massachusetts service. Some of our Minutemen enlisted the same day, but Captain Pond went home 
and several of his company they went as far as Dr. Cheney's that night, and the next morning reached home. On Monday the company were called together in order to enlist men. Lieutenant Messenger with a party went down to Roxbury, and we still remaining in Mr. Slack's house. Also on the same day, there were four Tories carried through Roxbury, one mile from Boston, to Cambrig, three miles northwest from Boston, from Marshfield, thirty-one miles southeast from Boston. And there was a great shouting when they came through the camp. Tories were those who adhered to the British. It is a name derived from the vocabulary of British politics in the time of Charles the Second. A Tory, then, was an adherent of the crown. A Whig was an opposer of the government. The word first used in America about 1770. End of part 10. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 11 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 11. D28. This day our regiment paraded and went through the manual exercise. Then we grounded our firelocks, and every man sat down by their arms, and one A.B.L. Petty accidentally discharged his piece and shot two balls through the body of one Asa Cheney. Through his left side and right wrist, he lived about twenty-four hours and then expired. He belonged to Warpole, twenty-one miles southwest from Boston, and he was carried there and buried on the thirty day of April. On Sunday, after meeting this young man was but a few days before fired at by one main guard in attempting to pass the guard, and was not hurt in the least. D-29 About nine o'clock the said Cheney died, about four in the afternoon. We had another alarm, but there was nothing done. Thirtieth Being the Lord's Day, we went to meeting and heard Mr. Adams, Reverend Amos Adams, a minister at Roxbury. He was a graduate of Harvard College. He died of dysentery, which prevailed in the camp at Dorchester on the 5th of October, 1775, in the 48th year of his age. And he preached a very suitable sermon for the occasion. May. 1D. Nothing very remarkable this day. 2D to 11. Nothing of consequence happened. 12.14. No great for news. 15.16. No news worth mentioning. 17. At night there was a fire broke out in Boston, occasioned by the King's troops that were dealing out their stores, when one of the soldiers letting a candle fall amongst some powder and set it on fire, which occasioned the destruction of a great number of buildings and killed some soldiers, and destroyed a considerable deal of their ammunitions, besides a great quantity of flour. 18.19. Nothing very remarkable. 20. Nothing strange today. 21. Being Sunday, about eight o'clock we were alarmed, and we heard that regulars were landing at Dorchester Point, and that there were two lighters gone to Weymouth loaded with the King's troops, but it was a false alarm, and there was nothing done. On Sunday morning, the 21st of May, the British commander sent two sloops and an armed schooner to take off a quantity of hay from Grape Island. They were opposed by the people who gathered on the point nearest the island. These finally got two vessels afloat, went to the island, drove the British off, burnt eighty tons of hay, and brought off many cattle. There was some severe fighting during the affair. Mrs. John Adams, writing to her husband, said, you inquire who were at the engagement at Grape Island. I may say with truth, all of Weymouth, Braintree, and Hingham, who were able to bear arms. Both your brothers were there, your younger brother with his company, who gained honour by their good order that day. He was one of the first to venture on board a schooner to land upon the island. 
Mr. Adams was then in the Continental Congress at Philadelphia. 22. Nothing today for news. 23 to 26. Nothing remarkable. The 27. At night we heard the report of cannon and of small arms, but we could not tell from whence it was. On Saturday, May 27th, a detachment of Americans was sent to drive all the livestock from Hog and Noodles Islands near Boston. They were observed by the British, who dispatched a sloop, a schooner, and forty marines to oppose them. They were fired on from the vessels, and quite severe skirmishing continued through the night. The Americans sent for reinforcements, and at about nine o'clock at night some three hundred men and two pieces of cannon arrived, commanded by General Putnam in person, and accompanied by Dr. Warren as a volunteer. They compelled the British to abandon their sloop, and the Americans took possession of it. The British lost twenty killed and fifty wounded. The Americans had none killed and only four wounded. They captured twelve swivels and four four-pound cannon, besides clothing and money. The 28. Being Sunday, we were informed that the firing we heard yesterday was at Nedler's Island, Noddles, between the King's troops and our men. Our men killed several of them and took a number of field pieces and burnt two schooners, and they did not hurt any of our men. The 29. Nothing remarkable this day. The 30. Captain Pond's company moved to Commodore Loring's house. Probably the house of Joshua Loring, Jr., near Roxbury, who was a violent loyalist. General Gage made him sole auctioneer in Boston. He was afterwards commissary of prisoners in New York. His wife is referred to in Hopkinson's poem, The Battle of the Kegs. The 31. Being election day, we drank the ladies' health and success. June the 1. Nothing remarkable happened this day. The 2 to 8. Nothing remarkable happened. The 9. We passed muster before Colonel Robinson, Colonel John Robinson, who was second in command in the skirmish at Concord on the 19th of April. He commanded the detachment that guarded Boston Neck for some time. Speaking of that duty, Gordon remarks, The colonel was obliged, therefore, from the time mentioned, to patrol the guards every night, which gave him a round of nine miles to traverse, and received one month's pay. The 10. There was a man whipped for stealing. The 11. There was a soldier died at the hospital, which was the first that had died of sickness since we encamped. The same day there were two fire ships, harlots, drummed out from Rhodes Island, Compy. The 12. Nothing strange this day. The 13. Ditto. The 14. The General. General Thomas, who had command of the right wing, extending from Roxbury to Dorchester. General Artemus Ward was commander-in-chief until the arrival of Washington early in July. Seeing the reinforcement of the King's troops come to Boston, ordered the camps to be in readiness, also ordered that a number of teams be employed in carting fascines, fascines, and other materials for building breastworks, this being on Thursday. The 15. Nothing remarkable this day. The 16. Nothing of consequence this day. The 17. It being Saturday, the King's troops landed at Charleston and set the whole town on fire and laid it all in ashes. Then they proceeded to Bunker's Hill. This is a mistake. It was Breed's Hill, nearer Charleston than Boston than Bunker's Hill. Colonel William Prescott, and not General Putnam, was entrenched there and was in command during the engagement. He had been sent with a company the night before, about a thousand strong, to throw up a redoubt on Bunker's Hill. He made a mistake, and performed the work on Breed's Hill. The British had no suspicion of the work that went on during the sultry June night, and were greatly alarmed when they saw a formidable breastwork overlooking their shipping in the harbour, and menacing the city. During the engagement, General Putnam was on Bunker's Hill, urging on reinforcements for Prescott. Dr. Warren, just appointed Major General, joined Prescott as a volunteer during the battle, and was mortally wounded just as the conflict ended. It must be remembered that the writer of this journal was in General Thomas's division, which did not participate in the battle of the 17th of June, where Colonel Putnam, entrenched, and after an engagement which lasted the afternoon, the troops took the hill, and it is said that the nearest computation of the loss of the enemy 
was about fifteen hundred is killed and wounded. We're alarmed about one o'clock that day, and went down to our alarm post, and we lay there all the afternoon, and about six o'clock the troops fired from their breastwork on Boston Neck at our people in Roxbury, and we stayed until the firing was over, and then our regiment was ordered to Cambridge to assist our forces, and we reached there about twelve o'clock at night, and lodged in the meeting-house until break of day. Being Sunday, we turned out and marched in Proskett Hill, Prospect Hill. The Americans retreated from Breeds and Bunkers Hills to Winter and Prospect Hills and Cambridge. The remains of the American entrenchments on Prospect Hill were demolished in 1817. Expecting to come to an engagement, we halted at a house at the bottom of the hill and fixed for a battle. Then we marched up the hill, where we went to entrenching about twelve o'clock. Some of our men went down the hill towards the troops after some flour, and the troops fired at them, and wounded David Trisdell in the shoulder, and another in the leg. About four o'clock, Colonel Reed, Colonel James Reed of New Hampshire, he was active in the Battle of the 17th, he was a brave officer, and was at the head of a regiment at Ticonderoga the following year, he ordered his regiment to march to Roxbury, and we arrived there about sunset, very weary. The 19. Nothing remarkable this day. The 20. Ditto. The 21. Nothing worth a mentioning. 22. Ditto. The 23. Nothing remarkable today. The 24. The enemy fired again upon Roxbury, about three o'clock, and the guards fired upon each other, and there was one man killed, and we were alarmed. The Americans were alarmed on the 24th by indications that the whole British army in Boston was about to force its way across the Boston Neck. At noon they commenced throwing bombshells into Roxbury, but the alert soldiers prevented damage from them and saved the town. Colonel Miller of Rhode Island said in a letter, Such was the courage of our men that they would go and take up a burning carcass or bomb and take out the fuse. The 25. Sunday. Nothing remarkable. The 26. This morning, very early, our men went out to set Brown's house on fire, but did not affect it. The house and barns of Thomas Brown were on the neck, about a mile from Roxbury Meeting House, and were occupied by the British advance guard. Two Americans tried to set fire to the barn on the 24th and were killed. The 27. Nothing remarkable this day. The 28. We moved to a little house that Captain Bliggs formerly lived in, but we soon moved from there to Slack's house again. The 29. Nothing remarkable this day. The 30. Nothing happened, only there was a smart shower. End of part 11. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 12 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. By Abraham Tomlinson. Part 12. July. The one. Nothing remarkable this day. The two. Ditto. The British again hurled some shells into Roxbury on Sunday, the 2nd of July, but the extent of the damage was setting fire to one house, which was consumed. The three. Ditto. George Washington was chosen commander-in-chief of the Continental Armies on the 15th of June, 1775. He set out for the headquarters of the army at Cambridge on the 21st, reached there on the 2nd of July, and took formal command of the army on the morning of the 3rd. The 4. There was a flag of truce come out of town to our sentry on the neck. The 5. Nothing worth a mentioning today. The 6. Nothing remarkable this day. The 7. Early in the morning we were alarmed and all of us repaired to our alarm post and we had not been there long before we saw Brown's house and barn on fire, and they were both consumed.
a party of volunteers under Majors Tupper and Crane attacked the British advance guards, drove them in, and set fire to Brown's house. They took several muskets and retreated without loss. These were set on fire by some of our brave Americans, and they took one gun and two bayonets and one halberd. The eight, nine. Nothing remarkable. The ten. About eleven o'clock, there was a party of soldiers sent to Germantown. It is impossible to identify this place. A letter dated on the twelfth says, We have just got over land from Cape Cod, a large fleet of whaleboats, etc., etc. The place alluded to in the text was probably near Boston. To get some whaleboats. They marched down there that night. The next night being clear, they set out for Long Island and arrived there in short time. Then they plundered the island and took from thence nineteen head of horned cattle and a number of sheep and three swine. This party went from Roxbury camp. The report says that they brought from Long Island fifteen prisoners, two hundred sheep, nineteen cattle, thirteen horses, and three hogs. The prisoners were taken to Concord. Also eighteen prisoners, and amongst them were three women. The Eleven. Nothing remarkable this day. The Twelve. Major Tupper and his company returned to Roxbury with their prisoners, and the same day there was a party drafted out to go to Long Island to burn the buildings there when they were attacked by the king's troops and had a smart engagement. The party under Colonel Grayton mentioned in the preceding note. But we lost but one man, and he belonged to Captain Persons' company of Stroughton, twenty miles south from Boston. The thirteen. Nothing remarkable this day. The fourteen. Nothing remarkable until night, and then there was a man killed at the main guard with a cannonball. The fifteen seventeen. Nothing remarkable. The 18. Nothing remarkable this day. A strong party of Americans took possession of an advanced post in Roxbury, upon which the British kept up an incessant fire. The 19. We had an alarm, and we went to our alarm post and stayed there about one hour, and could not discover anything, so we returned to our barracks again. The 20. There was a man killed who belonged to Captain Batchelor's company in Cole Reed's regiment. He was killed by a gun's going accidentally off. He was shot about seven o'clock and died about nine o'clock the same night. His name was Wood, belonged to Upton. Upton is thirty-five miles southwest from Boston. He was about twenty-four or twenty-five years of age. The twentieth was observed throughout the camps as a day of fasting and prayer. Before daylight that morning, a party from Heath's regiment landed on Nantasket Point, set fire to the lighthouse, and brought away a thousand bushels of barley and a quantity of hay. The 21-24. Nothing remarkable. The 25. Our regiment, with four more, were under arms and marched towards Cambridge to meet General Ward. The 26. General Heath's regiment moved from Dorchester to Cambridge, and General Ward's regiment moved from Cambridge to Dorchester and took General Heath's barracks. The 27. Nothing remarkable this day. The 28. Ditto. The 29. Nothing bad. The 30. Being Sunday, we had an alarm and went to our fort. This was a very strong quadrangular work on the highest eminence in Roxbury. It had four bastions and in every respect was a regular work. It is now well preserved, the embankments being from six to fifteen feet in height from without. The same day there was a party of men drafted out to go to the lighthouse, and Major Tupper was commander of the party. On that day the British, five hundred strong, marched over the neck and built a slight breastwork to cover their guard. The American camp was in alarm all day, and that night the troops lay on their arms. The Tories in Boston were also alarmed, for they dreaded an invasion of the city by their exasperated countrymen. The 31. This day Major Tupper and his men returned to Roxbury with between thirty and forty prisoners, some regulars and some Tories, and some Marians, Marines, and had something of a battle, and we lost one man and another wounded, and our men burnt the lighthouse and took some plunder. The British commenced rebuilding the lighthouse on Nantasket Point. Major Tupper, with three hundred men, attacked the working party, killed ten or twelve men, and took the rest prisoners. 
He then demolished the works, but before he could leave, some armed boats came to oppose him. In the skirmishing that ensued, fifty-three of the British were killed or captured. Tupper lost one man killed and two wounded. There was an alarm. The firing began first at the floating battery, and then at the breastwork, and then the troops marched out and set the gorge tavern on fire. A party of British troops sallied out towards Roxbury, drove in the American pickets, and burned the tavern which was situated upon the portion of the neck nearest Roxbury. Our men took one prisoner, and the same night one of the enemy deserted, and came to our sentries at Dorchester Point, and brought away with him two guns and two cartridge boxes, and sixty rounds of cartridge, all in good order, and there were several more deserted to Cambridge the same night. August, Domina, 1775 The One The floating battery, when the British built their breastwork on the neck the Sunday previous, they had a floating battery brought into Charles River and moored it within three hundred yards of Seawell's Point. Went up towards Brookline Fort. The Brookline Fort was on Seawall's Point, between Roxbury and Cambridge. It commanded the entrance to Charles River. And our men, perceiving her move, they began to fire at her out of Colonel Reed's fort until they drove her back to her old place. The same day they fired from Roxbury Hill Fort, and it was said that they fired through their barracks. The two. Nothing remarkable this day. The three. Ditto. The four. Nothing remarkable today. Only I went to the main guard, and the enemy fired at us as we came up. The five. Ditto. The six. Being Sunday, nothing remarkable at night. I went on the picket guard. The seven. Nothing strange. The eight. Ditto. The nine. Nothing remarkable this day. Only I went upon fatigue. The ten. Nothing strange. We had a great rain. The eleven. There was three men whipped for deserting, and they were whipped ten stripes apiece. They belonged to the Connecticut forces. The twelve. Nothing remarkable today. I went upon fatigue to Dorchester. The village and church of Dorchester was four miles from Boston. The heights of Dorchester are in what is now called South Boston. End of part twelve. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 13 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775 by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 13. The Thirteen. Being Sunday, we went to hear Mr. Willard, Joseph Williard D.D., who was made President of Harford College in December 1781. He died in New Bedford in 1804, at the age of 64 years. And after meeting, our men went to entrench down at the George Tavern, and about break of day they got home. 14. There was nothing remarkable. I went upon fatigue down to the George Tavern. 15. Two o'clock this afternoon, when the lobsters, a nickname given to the British regulars, on account of their red suits, they were so called in England as early as the time of Queen Anne, fired on our guards, which was returned by our Roxbury fort, the firing was continued for some time, but how much to their damage we don't know. One of our men was slightly wounded, their firing was from a floating battery, and it is thought would have killed one or two men, if they had not lain down, for the ball passed within four foot of our barrack. The night passed without any alarm. The sixteen. This day they fired at our main guard, but no material damage was done. The remaining part of their malice seemed to be postponed to a future season. Our American guard kept their ground, and the night passed without any alarm, etc., etc. The seventeen. About nine o'clock the enemy fired upon our main guard and fatigue men. They threw four balls and two bombs, 
and one of the balls struck two guns which belonged to the main guard, and the men had them on their shoulders, but did not hurt them much. The 18. Behold their spite this morning. Before the sun rise, the enemy fired at our working party on the neck. This side of the George Tavern our riflemen fired at them, and it is thought killed two of them. But notwithstanding, all their firing of balls and bombs through some of them came so near that it could hardly be called an escape, yet there was not one man wounded on our side. One bomb was thrown in the evening, but did no damage. One of the enemy came to our sentries, and is now in our guard-house. The 19. I went upon fatigue. The morning began with firing from the wicked enemy at our guard, but did no hurt. In the afternoon they riflemen fired at the enemy, and they enemy at them, and they wounded one of the riflemen in the foot slightly, but what damage we did them is uncertain. Let this suffice for a short account of the transactions of the nineteen day. The twenty. I went upon the main guard at night. Our boats went up within gunshot of the common. The large park, known as Boston Common, extended down to the water's edge before the flats were filled in, and alarmed them by firing several guns, and then returned without any loss on our side. The twenty-one. Nothing remarkable happened this day. At night one of the enemy deserted and came to us. The twenty-two. We paraded. Nothing remarkable. I went down to the picket. The twenty-three, twenty-four. Nothing remarkable. The twenty-five. A flag of truce came out of town, but for what, I don't know. The twenty-six. This morning there was a man ran away from the floating battery. The twenty-seven. Being Sunday, but they make such a firing over at Bunker's Hill, that it seems to be more like the King's birthday than Sunday. But what success they have had, we are not able to determine. But we heard they had killed two men, and wounded three or four, four more. About nine o'clock on Sunday morning, the 27th, the British opened a heavy cannonade from Bunker's Hill, where they had built a strong redoubt, and from a ship and floating battery in Mystic River. The firing was directed upon the American works on Winter, Prospect, and Ploughed Hills. They continued to bombard these works daily until the 10th of September. The 28. But they still hold up their firing at Bunker's Hill. Nothing more remarkable this day. The 29. I went upon the picket down to the George Tavern, and the enemy fired several small arms at us, but did no damage. The 30. Very rainy. Nothing extraordinary this day. The 31. Nothing extraordinary this day, only it was rainy at night. Lieutenant Foster and four men went down to the picket. There was a famous tree in Boston, under which the Patriots had often held meetings since the time of the Stamp Act excitement. On that account it was called the Liberty Tree. It was a noble elm, and stood at the corner of the present Washington and Essex streets. On the 31st of August, 1775, the British cut it down, with no apparent motive but the indulgence of petty spite. An eyewitness of the event says, After a long spell of laughing and grinning, sweating and swearing and foaming, with malice diabolical, they cut down a tree, because it bore the name of liberty. A Tory soldier was killed by its fall. A poet of the day wrote, A Tory soldier on its topmost limb, The genius of the shade looked stern at him, And marked him out that same hour to dine, Where unsnuffed lamps burn low at Pluto's shrine. Then tripped his feet from off their cautious stand, Pale turned the wretch, he spread each helpless hand, and spread in vain, with headlong force he fell, nor stopped descending, till he stopped in hell. Septem. The One. This morning, very early, just past one o'clock, the enemy began to fire from their breastwork and their floating battery, which occasioned an alarm. Their firing seemed to be at our main guard and picket. They fired a number of guns, and threw several bombs, and they were permitted to kill two men, the one belonged to Colonel Huntington's regiment, Colonel Jebediah Huntingdon, of Norwich, Connecticut. The British now seemed determined to make a general assault upon the besiegers, and a heavy cannonade was opened simultaneously upon the Americans at Roxbury and in the vicinity of Cambridge, and the other belonged to Colonel Davidson's regiment, and one of the riflemen was slightly wounded. But see the providence of God in it, 
when six or seven hundred men were before the mouths of their cannon, there were but two men killed. We should not have thought it strange if they had killed twenty, considering the situation that they were in. Two of the regular sentries deserted about an hour before the firing began. This was the smartest firing that ever has been in this campaign. In the afternoon they fired upon our fatigue party, but did no damage. Also about sunset there were several guns fired on board the ships. There were several ships came into the harbour. Thus far the proceeding of the one day. The two. I went down to the right hand of the burying place, and we had not been there long before we were ordered off, and the cannon began to play upon the enemy from Roxbury Fort on the hill, and the field pieces from the breastwork in the thicket. The occasion of our men's firing upon them was this. They had advanced about thirty or forty rods this side of their breastwork on the neck, and were entrenching there. They threw up a slight breastwork a little in advance of their lines on the neck, and not far from the George Tavern. They fired several guns at us, but did no damage. In the afternoon we went down to our work again, expecting every moment when they would fire at us, but they never fired one gun in the afternoon. At night there was a platform carried down to the thicket in order to mount a cannon there, Nothing more remarkable today. The three. Being Sunday, we turned out about day and went to our alarm post, and it rained, and we came home, and John Coleman drank three pints cider at one draught. Nothing more remarkable this day. The four. We turned out this morning before day and went to our alarm posts. Nothing remarkable this day. At night I went upon the picket down to Lamb's Dam. Lamb's Dam was between Roxbury and Dorchester. There the Americans completed a strong work on the 10th of September, and mounted four eighteen-pounders. Nothing more remarkable. The five. Nothing remarkable. Only Benjamin McLean sent home ten letters at one draft by Lieutenant Bacon, and Lieutenant Foster had liked to have been put under guard for playing ball. The six. Nothing remarkable this day. At night our men went down below the George Tavern for a safe guard for the sentries. The seven. We turned out early this morning and went to our alarm post and had a smart scrimmage, skirmish, with no enemy. And this day I went upon the creek guard. Several ships sailed out of the harbour. Old White was buried and there was much joy. We cannot explain this local illusion. The eight. Came of the creek guard and nothing remarkable happened. Only the enemy fired at our fatigue party but did no damage at night upon the door guard. The nine. In the morning the enemy fired upon our fatigue party, but did them no damage. In the afternoon I went upon fatigue. At night our men carried several cannon down into the thicket to the breastworks there. The breastworks in the thicket were the Roxbury lines of fortifications in advance of the fort. End of part 13. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk Part 14 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 14. The Ten. Being Sunday, our men went on fatigue, and the enemy fired upon them, and broke three guns that were paraded, but hurt no man. At night there was a man deserted from Cambridge, and went to the enemy. The eleven. We turned out and went to our alarm post, and Ensign Parrot shook one of his men for disobeying orders. This day there was a boat drove ashore belonging to the regulars, and a sergeant and five men on board, and they were all taken prisoners. At night I went upon picket, and was almost frozen to death. The twelve. Our men went down to Lamb's Dam to entrenching, not above half a mile from the enemy's breastwork, but nothing remarkable happened. The 13. Colonel Clapp, officer of the day, our men took this day 26 prisoners from Mystic, 
Mystic River as we heard. The fourteen. This morning I went upon fatigue down in the street. The road leading from Roxbury across the neck into Boston, and the enemy fired one shot at us and struck the breastwork, but did no damage. Captain Pond. Captain Pond was from New Hampshire and was an officer in Colonel Stark's regiment, commanded of the party. The fifteen. There was a regular and two men of war's men from the vessels known as men of war ran away last night and this morning nothing more remarkable there was three guns fired on board the ship in cambridge bay the sixteen nothing remarkable happened only the regulars fired several shot at our men that were upon fatigue but did no damage the seventeen being sunday i went upon the fatigue and the enemy fired several times at our men but did no damage and they threw several bombs. The eighteen. I came of the creek guard, and the enemy fired several cannon at our men, but killed none, and only wounded one or two slightly. And last night there were several men ran away from a man of war, and towards night the enemy fired several shots from the ship in Cambridge Bay, but our men fired one shot from Prospect Hill at the ship in the bay, but did not strike her. The nineteen. The enemy began to fire about eight o'clock into the street, but did no damage, except slightly wounding one or two. At night I went upon the picket, and nothing remarkable happened. Also there was a man put under guard for coming on to the parade drunk. The Twenty Nothing remarkable happened this day. The enemy fired one shot at our fatigue party, but did no damage. They fired over at Bunker's Hill, and threw several bombs. The Twenty One Last night I was on the door guard, and this morning the enemy fired small arms at our men, but did no damage. In the afternoon they fired cannon, but to no purpose. The 22. Last night I was upon the door guard, this being the king's coronation. Coronation. George the Third and his wife Charlotte were crowned on the 22nd of September, 1761. It was always a holiday next to that of the king's birthday. The enemy fired a number of cannon, and towards night they put in balls, but did no damage. The 23. I went upon fatigue down in the street, and the enemy began to fire at us about nine o'clock, and fired without intermission for some time. By the best accounts, they fired above one hundred balls, and our men fired three cannon from our breastwork near Lamb's Dam, and one of the balls went into Boston amongst the housen. But through the good hand of divine providence, in all their firing, they did not kill one man, nor wound any except one or two slightly. Frothingham says, On the 23rd the British discharged 108 cannon and mortars on the works at Roxbury without doing any damage. The 24. Being Sunday we went to meeting and heard a fine sermon from Psalms 14.11. This day our men went on fatigue as usual, but the enemy did not fire upon them. The 25. I went on fatigue down in the thicket in the forenoon, and at noon I was taken not well, and did not go in the afternoon. Our men fired three field pieces at the enemy, but what execution they did we cannot determine. Nothing more. The 26. Nothing remarkable happened this day. Only there was two hundred men drafted out to go to the governor's island to take some cattle. The 27. Our men went out to the island and took twelve head of cattle, and two horses, and came without any molestation. This expedition was under Major Tupper. They burnt a fine pleasure boat just ready to be launched belonging to some British officers. At night I went upon the picket, and it rained very hard, and we turned into the housen, and Le Colonel Clapp, of the Rhode Island Army of Observation, under General Green, was officer of the picket. The 28. Nothing remarkable happened this day. There was two guns fired from the ship in Cambridge Bay. The 29. This day the ship sailed out of Cambridge Bay, and there was another came and took her place at night. I went on the picket without any supper, nothing remarkable. The 30. This morning our men fired one field piece as the regulars came to relieve their main guard, and that affronted them, and they began to fire their cannon from their breastwork and floating battery, and they fired about thirty cannon, but did no damage. Also last night there was two regulars deserted and came to our sentries, on the neck. 
nothing more remarkable this day. October A, 1775. The One. Being Sunday, I went to meeting up to the Connecticut forces, and Mr. Willard preached a sermon from Chronicles, the twentieth chapter, ten, eleven, twelve. V also in the afternoon, Mr. Willard preached a sermon from first of Corinthians, fifteen, chapter fifty four and fifty five verses. Also last night there were six marines deserted from on board the Scarborough. This was a sloop of war carrying twenty guns. The two. Nothing remarkable happened this day. General Thomas' brigade passed muster about sunset, as our picket paraded on the grand parade, the enemy fired three or four shots up to the meeting-house. One of the balls went through the shed by the Providence Tavern, but did no damage of consequence. At night our chimney-swallow went on the picket for nothing, and found himself. The three. Nothing remarkable happened this day. At night I went upon the picket. The four. We passed muster. Nothing remarkable happened this day. Only there was four of the enemy deserted at night. The five. Nothing remarkable happened this day. Only there was five or six prisoners went through the camp that were taken at Dartmouth. He probably refers to the prisoners taken in the armed schooner, Margareta, at Machias, Maine, in the month of May, by some Americans under Jeremiah O'Brien. Or they may have been of the crew of two small cruisers afterward captured by O'Brien. They were taken to Watertown, where the Provincial Congress of Massachusetts was in session, on board the prize that our men took. The six. The enemy fired between eighty and ninety cannon at our men, but killed nine only. Cut off one man's arm, and killed two cows. So much for this day. The seven. I went upon the creek guard, and nothing remarkable happened. At night there was a regular deserted, and the regular guard fired upon him but did not hurt him. End of part 14 Recording by FNH Please visit my blog at felbrig, that's F-E-L-B-R-I-G-G, dot blogspot dot com Part 15 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 15. The Eight. Being Sunday, it rained, and we had no preaching. Nothing remarkable happened. At night there was a regular deserted, and came to our men, and there was another set out, but they were discovered, and they took one of them. The Nine. About eight o'clock there was a rifle man whipped thirty-nine stripes for stealing, and afterwards he was drummed out of the camps. If the infernal regions had been opened, and Cain and Judas and Sam Hawkes, the writer of this journal, had been present, there could not have been a bigger uproar. The Ten. I went up on the creek guard, and nothing remarkable happened there. The Eleven. There was a rifleman. These riflemen were from Maryland. The company had been raised by order of Congress, and placed in command of Captain Michael Cressap, who, without a shadow of justice, was made to figure unfavorably in the celebrated speech attributed to Logan, the Mingo chief. Proof is abundant that the stain upon the character of Cressap by the speech of Logan from the pen of Jefferson, was unmerited. Captain Cressap was taken sick, and at about the time here indicated, he started for home, but died at New York on the 18th of October, 1775, at the age of 33 years. His remains yet lie buried in Trinity Churchyard, a few feet from Broadway. Drummed out of the camps for threatening his officers. Also I went to Cambridge with boats. The Twelve. This day nothing remarkable happened. Only I went to work along with the general at Mr. Parker's. At night I went upon the picket. The Thirteen. I went to chestnutting with a number of respectable gentlemen that belonged to the army, and we had a rifle frolic, shooting at a mark for liquor, and came home about ten o'clock. The Thirteen. About two or three o'clock, 
there was one of our men taken and carried to the quarter guard for theft. Abel Wetherill by name, but it was made up, and he was taken out at night and returned to his duty. The fourteen. This day nothing remarkable happened. The fifteen. Being Sunday, I went upon fatigue down to the George Tavern, and there was a flag of truce went in, and another came out. Communications are thus had between the belligerent armies. By common consent as a rule of war, a person approaching one army from another with a white flag is respected as a neutral, and to fire upon a flag, as the phrase is when the bearer is fired upon, is considered a great breach of faith and honour. The sixteen. Nothing remarkable happened. Colonel Reed's lady came down to review the regiment, and treated them. The wives of officers often visited permanent camps, and formed pleasant social parties. Mrs. Washington visited her husband at Cambridge, while he remained there. She also spent a portion of the winter with him at Valley Forge, and likewise at Morristown. Nothing more this day. The seventeen. I went to Chestnutting up to Newtown, Newton, seven miles north from Boston, and at night our floating batteries went up towards the cannon, and fired thirteen shots, but unlucky for them, one of their nine-pounders split, and killed one man dead, and wounded eight more, one of them, it is thought, mortally. The eighteen. I went upon the creek guard, and John Bates was launch corporal. Also in the afternoon there was three Boston men came out under pretense of fishing, but they made their escape to Dorchester Point. The nineteen was rainy, and nothing remarkable happened. The twenty. The things that were taken at the lighthouse were vendured, and went very high. When Major Tupper destroyed the lighthouse on Nantasket Point, he carried away all the furniture and the great lamp by which it was lighted. Nothing more remarkable happened this day. At night there was a regular deserted from the enemy. The twenty-one. I went upon the creek guard. The creek referred to is Stony Brook northward from Roxbury Fort, and it rained all day. Nothing remarkable happened. The 22. Being Sunday, nothing remarkable this day. The 23. Nothing remarkable happened at night. I went upon the picket, and nothing happened worth a mentioning. The 24. Nothing remarkable happened this day. Only we heard that the French were going to join us upon conditions that we would trade with them. As early as July 1775, Dr. Franklin had suggested the propriety of a political confederation of all the colonies, and the establishment of governmental relations with foreign powers, especially with France, which, it was well known, hated England. In November of that year, Benjamin Harrison, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Johnson, John Dickerson, and John Jay were appointed a committee to open and carry on correspondence with foreign governments, and in March following, Silas Dean was appointed a special agent of Congress to the Court of France. Rumours of such intentions appear to have reached the army, according to our journalist, as early as the 24th of October, 1775. The 25. We turned out and went to the alarm post, and it was very cold, and we came home and there was a high go of drinking brandy, and several of the company were taken not well pretty soon after. A very natural consequence. Nothing more this day. The 26. This morning, early, there were several ladies came down from Wrentham, and they went to Cambridge. And the rest of their acts, are they not written in Lamentations of Samuel Hawes? Finis. The 27. This day I went upon fatigue, and we got our stents done about noon. The 28. Nothing remarkable this day, only I was choose cook for our room, consisting of twelve men, and a hard game too. The 29. Being Sunday, the officers had hard work to get hands for the meeting. It was so cold. Nothing more this day. The 30. This day, nothing remarkable happened. The 31. Nothing remarkable. During the whole of October, affairs were very quiet, and no skirmish of importance occurred. The Essex Gazette of the 19th said, Scarcely a gun has been fired for a fortnight. On the 4th, a small fleet under Captain Mowat sailed from Boston Harbour and destroyed Falmouth, now Portland, Maine. On the 15th, a committee from Congress arrived to consult with Washington concerning the future and a reorganization of the army. November 1775 The 1. Last night the fire ran over Samuel Hawes' hair 
and that provoked him to wrath. Nothing very remarkable happened this day that I know of. The two. There were some gentlemen and ladies came down from Wrentham, and they went to Cambridge. The three. It was a very rainy day, and we went to Childsys, and had an old fudge fare you well, my friends. The four. Nothing remarkable happened this day, only the gentry went home to Wrentham. The five. Being the memorial fifth of November, the enemy fired from every ship in the harbour. Nothing more remarkable this day. The six. Nothing remarkable happened this day. The seven. There was a vendue opened at this house, and there was not less than a hundred and twenty dollars worth of things vendued, and sold at private sale, and swapped. The eight. Nothing remarkable happened this day that I know of. The nine. Nothing remarkable happened this day that is worth a mentioning. On this day there was a quite severe skirmish occurred at Lechmere Point, now Cambridgeport. The ten. This day I went home upon furlough, that is, a written permission from his commanding officer to leave for a specified time. Yesterday, Sergeant Yet went home. The eleven. I went to Captain Whiting's, and nothing remarkable happened. The twelve. Being Sunday, I went to meeting. Nothing more this day. The thirteen. This day the long-faced people trained at Wrentham, and Sarge Felt went upon picket and fired several times upon the sentries. The fourteen. This day I came down from Wrentham, with Sarge Felt, and at night there was three men deserted from the floating battery. This day we had a lottery, and Sarge Foster drawed a pair of breeches. At that time leather breeches were much in vogue, because they were durable. The more costly ones of buckskin were worn only by officers, worth five dollars, and there was considerable other trading carried on at night. There was eight men more deserted. The Sixteen Nothing remarkable happened. Captain Pond listed three or four men for the next campaign. Late in October, a new organization of the army took place, and enlistments for a certain term were commenced. Hitherto there had been great confusion in the matter. The army had gathered around Boston from sudden impulse, and it was continually changing. The excitement which had brought them together had in a measure subsided, and enlistments went on slowly. After a month's exertions, only five thousand names were enrolled, and Washington, lamenting the dearth of public spirit, almost despaired. Alluding to the selfishness exhibited in the camp, he says, Such stock-jobbing and fertility in all the low arts, to obtain advantages of one kind or another, I never saw before, and pray God I may never witness again. At night it was very cold. The seventeen. Very blustering, and there was a man with thirty and nine lashes for stealing and getting drunk, and running away, and afterwards he was drummed out of the camps. Thus he, etc. The eighteen. Nothing remarkable happened this day that I know of. The nineteen. This being Sunday, it was very pleasant, and we had preaching. Nothing more this day. The twenty. This day nothing very remarkable. At night there was a regular deserted, and swam over to Dorchester, and escaped. The twenty-one. This day nothing very remarkable. This day the picket was made easier by half, etc., etc. End of part 15 Visit on the web printandplay.co.uk Part 16 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 16. The 22. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. This day ended without anything remarkable. The 23. Being Thanksgiving, I went with Sergeant Felt up to Newtown and kept Thanksgiving there and returned to our barracks at night. And we had not been abed long when our captain came to us 
and ordered us all to lie upon our arms by order of General Washington Lissimo, General Lissimo, of the American army encamped at Cambridge and Roxbury and other places. On the previous day, General Putnam, with a strong detachment, broke ground at Cobble Hill, where the Moline Asylum now stands. The object was to erect batteries for the purpose of cannonading Boston. It was expected the British troops would sally out of the city and attack them, and that expectation caused Washington to issue the order for all the troops to be ready for action at a moment's warning. Nothing more this day that I know of. Only two regulars deserted at night on Cambridge side. Frothingham says two British sentinels came off in the night to the detachment of General Putnam. The 24. Nothing happened very remarkable this day that I know of. The 25. This morning, Captain Pond enlisted several men for the next campaign. Oh, you nasty slovenly, how your book looks. This remark refers to several blots of ink which disfigure the page of his journal on which he was writing. The 26. Being Sunday, it was stormy. Nothing remarkable this day. The 27. Nothing very remarkable happened this day. The 28. Nothing very strange. Only Pepperis Curacle came out of Boston, that old Tory dog. The 29. Nothing remarkable. Only one of our privateers took a prize richly laden. That was the British storeship Nancy, captured off Cape Ann, and carried into the harbour by Captain John Manley, commander of the American armed schooner Lee, one of the six vessels fitted out of Boston under the direction of Washington, before Congress had yet taken any measures to establish a navy. So valuable were the stores of the Nancy, that Washington supposed General Howe would immediately make efforts to recover her, and he had an armed force sent to Cape Ann to secure them. There were two thousand muskets, one hundred thousand flints, thirty thousand round shot for one, six, and twelve pounders, over thirty thousand musket shot, and a thirteen-inch brass mortar that weighed twenty-seven hundred pounds. The arrival of these produced great joy in the camp. Colonel Moylan, describing the scene, says, Old Put, General Putnam, was mounted on the mortar, with a bottle of rum in his hand, standing parson to Christum, while Godfather Mifflin, afterward General Mifflin, gave it the name of Congress. On the 29th of November, Washington commenced planting a bomb battery on Lechmere's Point, with the intention of bombarding the British works on Bunker Hill. They completed it in the course of a few days, entirely unmolested. The 30. Nothing extraordinary this day, that I know of. December. The 1. Nothing remarkable this day. The 2. This day, I, with a number of respectable gentlemen, went. The author did not expect to have his journal published, or he would have omitted the entry made here. There seems nothing in it derogatory to his character, yet he has chosen words to express his thoughts not suited to ears polite. The 3. Being Sunday, it rained. Nothing remarkable happened this day. The 4. Nothing remarkable happened this day. At night we were ordered to lie upon our arms. Washington was now in hourly expectation of an attack from the British, and knowing his own weakness, he considered his situation very critical. In vigilance alone seemed a security for safety. The 5. Nothing strange happened this day. The 6. Nothing comical this day, only there was considerable of trading carried on. The Yankee love of trade and barter appears to have been very prevalent in the camp. The 7. This day nothing strange. The 8. This day I, with several more, enlisted for the year 1776 under Captain Oliver Pond. The 9. Nothing remarkable this day. The 10. This day the long-faced people, new militia recruits from the country who had never seen service, arrived here from Wrentham and other places. The 11. This day I passed muster before General Spencer, General Joseph Spencer of East Haddam, Connecticut. He remained in service until 1778 when he resigned, left the army, and became a member of Congress. He held rank next to Putnam in the army of Boston. He died in 1789 at the age of 70 years. Nothing more this day. The 12. This day it was very cold, and the militia had to mount guard. That is good for them. The 13. 
This day I went to Cambridge and viewed the works on Cobble, Cobble Hill. These, it is said, were the most perfect of any of the fortification raised around Boston at that time. The 14. This day I went to Watertown, seven miles northwest from Boston. It was then the seat of the revolutionary government in Massachusetts. With Lieutenant Bacon and a number of others in order to get some coats, but we could not find any that suited us, and so we returned. Washington issued a notice on the 28th of October that tailors would be employed to make coats for those who wished them. The 15. This day nothing very remarkable. The 16. This day nothing strange. At night there was an attempt made to blow up a ship, but it failed. Also this night we heard that Quebec was taken. This was a mistake. On the 13th of September, Colonel Benedict Arnold left Cambridge with a detachment to cross the country by way of the Kennebec, to invade Canada and capture Quebec. Arnold's army suffered terribly on the march, and arrived at Point Levy, opposite Quebec, on the 9th of November, and prepared to attack the city. He was obliged to postpone his attack, and Quebec never fell into the hands of the Patriots. The 17. Being Sunday, it was foul weather. Nothing remarkable happened this day. Only the enemy fired at our men on Lechmere's, Lechmere's point, and wounded one, and our men returned the fire from Copple Hill. The 18. This day the ship moved out of the bay, and the enemy threw bombs from Mount Hordorm, a nickname given to Bunker's Hill, but it did no damage. The 19. This day nothing remarkable happened. The 20. Nothing strange this day. The 21. This day it was very cold. Nothing strange this day. The 22. Nothing remarkable this day. The 23. Nothing strange this day. The 24. Ditto, ditto, ditto. The 25. Good. The 26. Very cold this day. Nothing remarkable this day. The 27. Nothing remarkable today. The 28. Nothing strange this day. The 29. Nothing strange this day. Last night our men made an attempt to take Bunker Hill, but their scheme was frustrated, etc. On the night of the 28th, an unsuccessful attempt was made to surprise the British outposts on Charleston Neck, and then to attack the enemy on Bunker's Hill. The Americans started to cross from Cobble Hill on the ice. One of the men slipped and fell when they were halfway across. His gun went off. This alarmed the British, and they were on their guard. It was computed that, from the burning of Charleston on the 17th of June till Christmas Day, the British had fired more than 2,000 shot and shells. They hurled more than 300 bombshells at Ploughed Hill and 100 at Lechmere's Point. Gordon says that with all this waste of metal, they killed only seven men on the Cambridge side and just a dozen on the Roxbury side. The 30, 31. Nothing remarkable. January. The 1. A happy new year, 1776. Behold the man, three score and ten, upon a dying bed. He's run his race, and get no grace, and awful sight indeed. Nothing very remarkable this one day of January, 1776. Anno quid domina. Anno domini. The two. Nothing strange this day. The three. Twenty men out of each regiment in Roxbury sighed to cut for sheens. For scenes. I believe we have it by and by. The four. Nothing remarkable this day. The five dash seven. Nothing strange. The eight. At night, some of our brave heroic Americans went past the enemy's breastwork at Bunker Hill and burnt several housen at the foot of Bunker Hill and took five men and one woman prisoners and came off as far as Copple Hill when the flames began to extend and the enemy that were in the fort Perceiving a number of men gather round the fire, and supposing them to be our men, they kept up a bright fire for the space of nearly half an hour upon their own men, devil light fully. Delightfully. They? When Charleston was burned, fourteen houses escaped the flames. These were occupied by the British, and on the 8th of January, General Putnam sent Major Knowlton, afterward killed at Harlem, with a small party to set those houses on fire. The affair was injudiciously managed and before all could be fired, the flames of one alarmed the British in the fort. They discharged cannons and small arms in all directions in their confusion and affright. At that moment a play called The Blockade of Boston, written for the occasion by General Burgoyne, was in the course of performance in the city. 
In the midst of a scene in which Washington was burlesqued, a sergeant dashed into the theatre and exclaimed, "'The Yankees are attacking Bunker's Hill!' The audience thought it was part of the play, until General Howe said, "'Officers, to your alarm posts!' Then women shrieked and fainted, and the people rushed to the streets in great confusion. The Nine. Nothing remarkable this day. The Ten. Nothing very remarkable this day. It was very cold. The Eleven. Nothing very remarkable this day. The Twelve. All furloughs stopped this day. The Thirteen. Nothing strange this day. The Fourteen. Being Sunday, nothing remarkable this day. The Fifteen. This day we heard that the regulars had taken Providence and burnt all the housing except two. Sir James Wallace commanded a small British flotilla in Narragansett Bay during the summer of autumn 1775. He was really a commissioned pirate, for he burnt and plundered dwellings and stores and plantations whenever he pleased. The fact above alluded to was the plunder and destruction of the houses on the beautiful island of Providence not the town of Providence, by that marauder, at the close of November 1775. He also desolated Conanicut Island, opposite Newport, and every American vessel that entered that harbour was seized and sent to Boston. The 16. Nothing remarkable happened this day. At night we were all ordered to lie upon our arms. The 17. This day we had the disagreeable news that our men were defeated that went to Quebec, and that General Montgomery and Colonel Arnold were either killed or taken prisoners. But we pray God thy news may prove false. Arnold, with only seven hundred men, appeared before Quebec on the 18th of November, and demanded its surrender. He was soon compelled to retire, and marching up the St. Lawrence twenty miles, he there met in December General Montgomery with a small force, descending from Montreal. They marched against Quebec, and early in the morning of the 31st of December proceeded to assail the city at three distinct points. Montgomery was killed, Morgan and many of the Americans were made prisoners, and Arnold, who was severely wounded, retired to Sillery, three miles above Quebec. At night it was thought there was a spy out from Boston, and our sentries fired at him, but we don't know the certainty of it. Cold weather for the season. End of Part 16 Recording by FNH please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 17 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 17. The 18. Nothing strange this day. The 19. This day we heard that our men had taken a ship loaded with gunpowder. The truth of it we have not yet learned, but we hope it will prove true. Several of the prizes captured by Manley and others contained powder and arms, and late in December Colonel, afterward General Knox, arrived from Ticonderoga with forty-two sled-loads of cannons, mortars, lead, balls, flints, etc. By the close of January powder became quite plentiful in the American camp. The 20. Nothing remarkable this day. The 21. Ditto. The 22. Nothing strange. The 23. Nothing remarkable. The 24. This day... Captain Pond came from Wrentham. Nothing remarkable. The 25. Nothing remarkable this day. The 26. Nothing very remarkable. The 27. Nothing remarkable this day. The 28. Nothing remarkable. The 29. This day we moved to Dorchester, into the Widow Bird's house. The 30. Nothing strange this day. The 31. Ditto. February. The one. This day, nothing remarkable. The two. Ditto. The three. Nothing remarkable this day. The four. Ditto. The five. The lobsters came out almost to Copple Hill, and took three cows and killed them, and were fired upon from Copple Hill, and they were obliged to make of leaving their booty behind them. The six. 
the militious men, militia men, marched from Wrentham and arrived in camp at Dorchester. The seven. Nothing very remarkable this day. The eight. There was a number of our men went to skating on the bay near Boston Common, and the enemy fired upwards of a hundred small arms that did no damage. The nine. Nothing very remarkable. At night, there was three of our American boys made their escape from the enemy in Boston, and were taken up by our men who were patrolling on Dorchester Point too, and they brought of things too considerable value. The ten. Nothing strange this day. Here the journal ends abruptly, and we have no clue to the writer afterward. As he had enlisted for the campaign of 1776, he doubtless remained with the army until the expulsion of the British from Boston in March following, unless he was killed in some of the skirmishes that frequently occurred, or was obliged to leave the army on account of sickness. Whatever was his fate, the veil of oblivion is drawn over it, for he was one of the thousands who, with warm hearts and stout hands, struggled in the field for the liberties of their country, lie in unhonoured graves, and have no biographers. If he lived until the conflict ended, and died in his native town, no doubt his grave is in the old churchyard at Wrentham. His family was among the earliest settlers there, for Daniel Hawes was a resident of the village when it was burnt, in the time of King Philip's War, almost two hundred years ago, and on a plain slab in that old burial place is the name of Ebenezer Hawes, who died in 1812, at the age of ninety-one years. Supplement containing official papers of the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord, and a list of revolutionary articles in the Poughkeepsie Museum. Supplement, official papers concerning the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord. In the preceding journal of a soldier in 1775, his narrative commences on the day of the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord, the opening conflicts of the revolution. Some official matters relating to those events, which are inaccessible to the general reading public, will doubtless be acceptable, as they certainly are appropriate in this connection. The skirmishes occurred on the 19th of April, 1775. On the 22nd, the Provincial Congress of Massachusetts assembled, and deeming it important to have the whole truth known, appointed a committee to take depositions in relation to the transactions of the British troops in their route to and from Concord. Another committee was appointed the following day, consisting of Dr. Church, Eldbridge Jerry, and Thomas Cushing, to draw up a narrative of the massacre. The committee to take depositions held their sessions at Concord and Lexington on the 23rd and 25th of April. Feeling it to be expedient to send an account immediately to England, a committee consisting of Dr. Warren, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Gardner, and Colonel Stone, was chosen to prepare a letter to Dr. Franklin, the colonial agent in London. They reported a letter, and also an address to the inhabitants of Great Britain, on the same day. Captain Richard Darby, of Salem, was employed to proceed immediately with the dispatches. He placed them in the hands of Dr. Franklin on the 29th of May, and on the following day the address was printed and circulated. It gave the first intelligence of the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord to the British public. The following, copied from the journals of the Continental Congress, are the several papers referred to. To the Honourable Benjamin Franklin, Esquire, at London, in Provincial Congress, Watertown, April 26th, 1775. Sir, from the entire confidence we repose in your faithfulness and abilities, we consider it the happiness of this colony that the important trust of agency for it, in this day of unequal distress, is devoted on your hands, and we doubt not your attachment to the cause and liberties of mankind will make every possible exertion in our behalf a pleasure to you. Although our circumstances will compel us often to interrupt your repose by matters that will surely give you a pain, a singular instance hereof is the occasion of the present letter. The contents of this packet will be our apology for troubling you with it. From these you will see how, and by whom, we are at last plunged into the horrors of a most unnatural war. Our enemies, we are told, have dispatched to Great Britain a fallacious account of the tragedy they have begun to prevent the operation of which, to the public injury, we have engaged the vessel that conveys this to you, as a packet in the service of this colony, and we request your assistance in supplying Captain Darby, who commands her, with such necessaries as he shall want, on the credit of your constituents in Massachusetts Bay. 
but we most ardently wish that the several papers herewith enclosed may be immediately printed and dispersed through every town in England, and especially communicated to the Lord Mayor, Alderman, and Council of the City of London, and that they may take such an order thereon as they may think proper. And we are confident your fidelity will make such an improvement of them as shall convince all who are not determined to be in everlasting blindness, that it is the united efforts of both Englands that can save either. But that whatever price our brethren in the one may be pleased to put on their constitutional liberties, we are authorized to assure you that the inhabitants of the other, with the greatest unanimity, are inflexibly resolved to sell theirs only at the price of their lives. Signed by the order of the Provincial Congress, Joseph Warren, President, P.T. A true copy from the original minutes, Samuel Freeman, Secretary, P.T. The depositions relative to the commencement of hostilities are as follows. Lexington, April 25th, 1775. We, Solomon Brown, Jonathan Loring, and Elijah Sanderson, all of lawful age and of Lexington, in the county of Middlesex and colony of Massachusetts Bay in New England, do testify and declare that on the evening of the 18th of April, instant, being on the road between Concord and Lexington, and all of us mounted on horses, we were about ten of the clock, suddenly surprised by nine persons, whom we took to be regular officers, who rode up to us, mounted and armed, each having a pistol in his hand, and after putting pistols to our breasts and seizing the bridles of our horses, they swore if we stirred another step, we should be all dead men, upon which we all surrendered ourselves. They detained us until two o'clock of the next morning, in which time they searched and greatly abused us, having first inquired about the magazine at Concord, whether any guards were posted there, and whether the bridges were up, and said four or five regiments of regulars would be in possession of the stores soon. They then brought us back to Lexington, cut the horses' bridles and girths, turned them loose, and left us. Solomon Brown, Jonathan Loring, Elijah Sanderson. End of Part 17 Recording by FNH Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk Part 18 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. By Abraham Tomlinson. Part 18. Lexington. April 25th. 1775. I, Elijah Sanderson, above named, do further testify and declare that I was on Lexington Common the morning of the 19th of April, aforesaid, having been dismissed by the officers above mentioned, and saw a large body of regular troops advancing towards Lexington Company, many of whom were then dispersing. I heard one of the regulars whom I took to be an officer say, Damn them, we will have them, and immediately the regulars shouted aloud, run and fired upon the Lexington Company, which did not fire a gun before the regulars discharged on them. Eight of the Lexington Company were killed while they were dispersing, and at a considerable distance from each other, and many wounded, and although a spectator, I narrowly escaped with my life. Elijah Sanderson Lexington, April 23, 1775 I... Thomas Rice Willard, of lawful age, do testify and declare that being in the house of Daniel Harrington of said Lexington on the nineteenth instant in the morning, about half an hour before sunrise, looked out at the window of said house, and saw, as I suppose, about four hundred regulars in one body coming up the road, and marched towards the north part of the common, back of the meeting-house of said Lexington. And as soon as said regulars were against the east end of the meeting-house, the commanding officer said something, what I know not, but upon that the regulars ran till they came within about eight or nine rods of about a hundred of the militia of Lexington, who were collected on said common, at which time the militia of Lexington dispersed. Then the officers made a huzzah, and the private soldiers succeeded them, 
Directly after this, an officer rode before the regulars to the other side of the body, and hallooed after the militia of said Lexington, and said, Lay down your arms, damn you! Why don't you lay down your arms? And that there was not a gun fired till the militia of Lexington were dispersed, and further saith not. Thomas Rice Willard Lexington, April twenty fifth, 1775 Simon Winship of Lexington, in the county of Middlesex, and province of Massachusetts Bay, New England, being of lawful age, testifieth and saith, that on the 19th April instant, about four o'clock in the morning, as he was passing the public road in said Lexington, peaceably and unarmed, about two miles and a half distance from the meeting-house in said Lexington, he was met by a body of King's regular troops, and being stopped by some officers of said troops, was commanded to dismount. Upon asking why he must dismount, he was obliged by force to quit his horse, and ordered to march in the midst of the body, and, being examined whether he had been warning the Minutemen, he answered, No, but had been out, and was then returning to his father's. Said Winship further testifies that he marched with said troops till he came within half a quarter of a mile of said meeting-house, where an officer commanded the troops to halt, and then to prime and load. This being done, the said troops marched on till they came within a few rods of Captain Parker's company, who were partly collected on the place of parade, when said Winship observed an officer at the head of said troops flourishing his sword, and with a loud voice giving the word, Fire! Fire! which was instantly followed by a discharge of arms from said regular troops, and said Winship is positive, and in the most solemn manner declares, that there was no discharge of arms on either side till the word fire was given by the said officer as above. Simon Winship Lexington, April 25th, 1775 I, John Parker, of lawful age, and commander of the militia in Lexington, do testify and declare that on the nineteenth instant, in the morning, about one of the clock, being informed that there were a number of regular officers riding up and down the road, stopping and insulting people as they passed the road, and also was informed that a number of regular troops were on their march from Boston, in order to take the province stores at Concord, ordered our militia to meet on the common in said Lexington, to consult what to do, and concluded not to be discovered, nor meddle, or make said with regular troops, if they should approach, unless they should insult or molest us, and, upon their sudden approach, I immediately ordered our militia to disperse, and not to fire. Immediately said troops made their appearance, and rushed furiously, fired upon, and killed eight of our party, without receiving any provocation therefore from us. John Parker Lexington, April twenty fourth, 1775 I, John Robbins, being of lawful age, do testify and say that, on the nineteenth instant, the company under the command of Captain John Parker, being drawn up some time before sunrise, on the green or common, and I being in the front rank, there suddenly appeared a number of the king's troops, about a thousand, as I thought, at the distance of about sixty or seventy yards from us, huzzaring, and on a quick pace towards us, with three officers in their front on horseback, and on full gallop towards us, the foremost of which cried, Throw down your arms, ye villains, ye rebels! Upon which, said company dispersing, the foremost of the three officers ordered their men, saying, Fire, by God, fire! At which moment we received a very heavy and close fire from them, at which instant, being wounded, I fell, and several of our men were shot dead by me. Captain Parker's men, I believeth, had not then fired a gun, and further the deponent saith not. John Robbins Lexington, April twenty fifth, seventeen seventy five. We, Benjamin Tidd of Lexington, and Joseph Abbott of Lincoln, in the county of Middlesex and colony of Massachusetts Bay, in New England, of lawful age, do testify and declare that on the morning of the nineteenth of April instant, about five o'clock, being on Lexington Common and mounted on horses, we saw a body of regular troops marching up to the Lexington Company, which was then dispersing. Soon after, the regulars fired. First a few guns, which we took to be pistols from some of the regulars who were mounted on horses, and then the said regulars fired a volley or two before any guns were fired by the Lexington Company. Our horses immediately started, and we rode off, and further say not. Benjamin Tidd, Joseph Abbott Lexington, April twenty fifth, 1775 We, Nathaniel Mullikin, Philip Russell, Moses Harrington, Jr., Thomas and Daniel Harrington, William Grimes, William Tidd, 
Isaac Hastings, Jonas Stone, Jr., James Wyman, Taddeus Harrington, John Chandler, Joshua Reed, Jr., Joseph Simmons, Phineas Smith, John Chandler, Jr., Reuben Cock, Joel Viles, Nathan Reed, Samuel Tidd, Benjamin Locke, Thomas Winship, Simeon Snow, John Smith, Moses Harrington the Third, Joshua Reed, Ebenezer Parker, John Harrington, Enoch Willington, John Hornier, Isaac Green, Phineas Stearns, Isaac Durant, and Thomas Headley, Jr., all of lawful age, and inhabitants of Lexington in the county of Middlesex and colony of Massachusetts Bay in New England, do testify and declare that on the 19th of April instant, about one or two o'clock in the morning, being informed that several officers of the regulars had, the evening before, been riding up and down the road, and had detained and insulted the inhabitants passing the same, and also understanding that a body of regulars were marching from Boston towards Concord, with the intent, as it was supposed, to take the stores belonging to the colony in that town. We were alarmed, and having met at the place of our company's parade, were dismissed by our captain, John Parker, for the present, with orders to be ready to attend at the beat of the drum. We further testify and declare that about five o'clock in the morning, hearing our drum beat, we proceeded towards the parade, and soon found that a large body of troops were marching towards us. Some of our company were coming up to the parade, and others had reached it, at which time the company began to disperse. While our backs were turned on the troops, we were fired on by them, and a number of our men were instantly killed and wounded. Not a gun was fired by any person in our company on the regulars, to our knowledge, before they fired on us, and they continued firing until we had all made our escape. Signed by each of the above deponents. End of Part 18 Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 19 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F&H. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758 to 1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 19. Lexington, 25th of April, 1775. We, Nathaniel Parkhurst, Jonas Parker, John Monroe, Jr., John Winship, Solomon Pierce, John Muzzy, Abner Meads, John Bridge, Jr., Ebenezer Bowman, William Monroe the Third, Micah Hager, Samuel Sanderson, Samuel Hastings, and James Brown, of Lexington, in the county of Middlesex and colony of Massachusetts Bay, in New England, and all of lawful age, do testify and say that on the morning of the 19th of April instant, about one or two o'clock, being informed that a number of regular officers had been riding up and down the road the evening and night preceding, and that some of the inhabitants, as they were passing, had been insulted by the officers, and stopped by them, and being also informed that the regular troops were on their march from Boston, in order, as it was said, to take the colony stores then deposited at Concord, we met on the parade of our company in this town. After the company had collected, we were ordered by Captain Parker, who commanded us, to disperse for the present, and to be ready to attend the beat of the drum, and accordingly the company went into houses near the place of parade. We further testify and say that about five o'clock in the morning we attended the beat of the drum, and were formed on the parade. We were faced towards the regulars then marching up to us, and some of our company were coming to the parade with their backs towards the troops, and others on the parade began to disperse when the regulars fired on the company before a gun was fired by any of our company on them. They killed eight of our company and wounded several, and continued their fire until we had all made our escape. Signed by each of the deponents. Lexington, April 25th, 1775. I, Timothy Smith of Lexington, in the county of Middlesex and the colony of Massachusetts Bay in New England, being of lawful age, do testify and declare that on the morning of the 19th of April instant, being on Lexington Common as a spectator, 
I saw a large body of regular troops marching up towards Lexington Company, then dispersing, and likewise saw the regular troop fire on the Lexington Company, before the latter fired a gun. I immediately ran, and a volley was discharged at me, which put me in imminent danger of losing my life. I soon returned to the common, and saw eight of the Lexington men who were killed, and lay bleeding at considerable distance from each other, and several were wounded, and further saith not. Timothy Smith Lexington, April 25th, 1775 We, Levi Meade and Levi Harrington, both of Lexington in the county of Middlesex and colony of Massachusetts Bay, in New England, and of lawful age, do testify and declare that on the morning of the 19th of April, being on Lexington Commons as spectators, we saw a large body of regular troops marching up towards Lexington Company, and some of the regulars, on horses, whom we took to be officers, fired a pistol or two on the Lexington Company, which was then dispersing. These were the first guns that were fired, and they were immediately followed by several volleys from the regulars, by which eight men belonging to said company were killed and several wounded. Levi Harrington, Levi Meade. Lexington, April 25th, 1775. I, William Draper, of lawful age, and an inhabitant of Coleraine in the county of Hampshire and colony of Massachusetts Bay, in New England, do testify and declare that being on the parade of said Lexington, April 19th instant, about half an hour before sunrise, the King's regular troops appeared at the meeting-house of Lexington. Captain Parker's company, who were drawn up back of the said meeting-house on the parade, turned and said troops making their escape by dispersing. In the meantime the regular troops made a huzzah and ran towards Captain Parker's company, who were dispersing. And immediately after the huzzah was made, the commanding officer of said troops, as I took him, gave the command to said troops, Fire! Fire! Damn you! Fire! And immediately they fired before any of Captain Parker's company fired. I then being within three or four rods of said regular troops, and further say not. William Draper Lexington, April 23rd, 1775 I, Thomas Fessenden, of lawful age, testify and declare that on being in a pasture near the meeting-house at said Lexington on Wednesday last, at about half an hour before sunrise, I saw a number of regular troops pass speedily by said meeting-house, on their way towards a company of militia of said Lexington, who were assembled to the number of about one hundred in a company, at the distance of eighteen or twenty rods from said meeting-house. And after they had passed by said meeting-house, I saw three officers on horseback advance to the front of said regulars, when one of them being within six rods of said militia, cried out, Disperse you rebels immediately! On which he brandished his sword over his head three times. Meanwhile the second officer, who was about two rods behind him, fired a pistol pointed at said militia, and the regulars kept huzzaring until he had finished brandishing his sword. And when he had thus finished brandishing his sword, he pointed it down towards said militia, and immediately on which the said regulars fired a volley at the militia. And then I ran off as fast as I could, while they continued firing till I got out of their reach. I further testify that as soon as ever the officer cried, Disperse, you rebels, the said company of militia dispersed every way, as fast as they could, and while they were dispersing, the regulars kept firing at them incessantly. And further saith not. Thomas Fessenden Lincoln, April 23rd, 1775 I, John Bateman, belonging to the 52nd Regiment commanded by Colonel Jones, on Wednesday morning, on the 19th day of April instant, was in the party marching to Concord, being at Lexington, in the county of Middlesex, being nigh the meeting-house in said Lexington, there was a small party of men gathered together at that place, when our said troops marched by. And I testify and declare that I heard the word of command given to the troops to fire, and some of said troops did fire, and I saw one of said small party lay dead on the ground nigh said the meeting-house. And I testify that I never heard any of the inhabitants so much as fire one gun on said troops. John Bateman Lexington, April 23rd, 1775 We, John Hoare, John Whithead, Abraham Garfield, Benjamin Monroe, Isaac Parks, William Hosmer, John Adams, Gregory Stone, all of Lincoln in the county of Middlesex, Massachusetts Bay, all of lawful age, 
do testify and say that, on Wednesday last, we were assembled at Concord, in the morning of said day, in consequence of information received, that a brigade of regular troops were on their march to said town of Concord, who had killed six men at the town of Lexington. About an hour afterwards, we saw them approaching, to the number, as we apprehended, of about twelve hundred, on which we retreated to a hill about eighty rods back, and the said troops then took possession of the hill where we were first posted. Presently after this we saw the troops moving towards the North Bridge, about one mile from said Concord Meeting House. We then immediately went before them, and passed the bridge just before a party of them, to the number of about two hundred, arrived. They there left about one half of their two hundred at the bridge, and proceeded with the rest towards Colonel Barrett's, about two miles from said bridge. We then, seeing several fires in the town, thought the houses in Concord were in danger, and marched towards said bridge, and the troops that were stationed there, observing our approach, marched back over the bridge, and then took up some of the planks. We then hastened our march towards the bridge, and, when we had got near the bridge, they fired on our men. First three guns, one after the other, and then a considerable number more and then, and not before, having orders from our commanding officers not to fire till we were fired upon, we fired upon the regulars, and they retreated. On their retreat through the town of Lexington to Charleston, they ravaged and destroyed private property, and burnt three houses, one barn, and one shop. Signed by each of the above deponents. End of Part 19 Recording by FNH Please visit cthulhupodcast.co.uk Part 20 Of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by FNH The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775 By Abraham Tomlinson Part 20 Lexington, April 23, 1775 We, Nathan Barrett, Captain Jonathan Farrer, Joseph Butler and Francis Wheeler, Lieutenants John Barrett, Ensign John Brown, Silas Walker, Ephraim Melvin Nathan Buttrick, Stephen Hosmer, Jr. Samuel Barrett, Thomas Jones, Joseph Chandler Peter Wheeler, Nathan Pierce, and Edward Richardson, all of Concord in the county of Middlesex, in the province of Massachusetts Bay, of lawful age, testify and declare that, on Wednesday, the 19th instant, about an hour after sunrise, we assembled on a hill near the meeting-house in Concord aforesaid, in consequence of information that a number of regular troops had killed six of our countrymen at Lexington, and were on their march to said Concord and about an hour afterwards we saw them approaching, to the number, as we imagine, of about twelve hundred, on which we retreated to a hill about eighty rods back, and the aforesaid troops then took possession of a hill where we were first posted. Presently after this we saw them moving towards the north bridge, about one mile from said meeting-house. We then immediately went before them and passed the bridge, just before a party of them, to the number of about two hundred, arrived. They there left about one half of these two hundred at the bridge, and proceeded with the rest towards Colonel Barrett's, about two miles from said bridge. We then, seeing several fires in the town, thought our houses were in danger, and immediately marched back towards said bridge, and the troops who were stationed there, observing our approach, marched back over the bridge, and then took up some of the planks. We then hastened our steps toward the bridge, and when we got near the bridge, they fired on our men, first three guns, one after the other, and then a considerable number more, upon which, and not before, having orders from our commanding officer not to fire till we were fired upon, we fired upon the regulars, and they retreated. At Concord, and on their retreat through Lexington, they plundered many houses, burnt three at Lexington, together with a shop and a barn, and committed damage, more or less, to almost every house from Concord to Charleston. Signed by the above deponents. We, Joseph Butler, and Ephraim Melvin, do testify and declare that when the regular troops fired upon our people at the North Bridge in Concord, as related in the foregoing depositions, they shot one, and we believe two, of our people before we fired a single gun at them. Joseph Butler, Ephraim Welvin, 
Lexington, April 23, 1775. Concord, April 23, 1775. I, Timothy Minot, Jr., of Concord on the 19th day of this instant, April, after that I had heard of the regular troops firing upon Lexington men, and fearing that hostilities might be committed at Concord, thought it my incumbent duty to secure my family. After I had secured my family, some time after that returning towards my own dwelling, and finding that the bridge on the north part of said Concord was guarded by regular troops, being a spectator of what had happened at said bridge, declare that the regular troops stationed on said bridge, after they saw the men that were collected on the westerly side of said bridge, marched towards said bridge. Then the troops returned towards the eastly side of said bridge, and formed themselves, as I thought, for regular fight. After that they fired one gun, then two or three more, before the men that were stationed on the westerly part of said bridge fired upon them. Timothy Minot, Jr. Lexington, April 23rd, 1775 I, James Barrett of Concord, Colonel of a regiment of militia in the county of Middlesex, do testify and say that on Wednesday morning last, about daybreak, I was informed of the approach of a number of regular troops to the town of Concord, where were some magazines belonging to this province, when there was assembled some of the militia of this and the neighbouring towns. I ordered them to march to the North Bridge, so called, which they had passed and were taking up. I ordered said militia to march to said bridge and pass the same, but not to fire on the king's troops unless they were first fired upon. We advanced near said bridge, when the said troops fired upon our militia and killed two men dead on the spot, and wounded several others, which was the first firing of guns in the town of Concord. My detachment then returned the fire, which killed and wounded several of the king's troops. James Barrett Lexington, April 23rd 1775. We, Bradbury Robinson, Samuel Spring, Taddeus Bancroft, all of Concord, and James Adam of Lexington, all in the county of Middlesex, all of lawful age, do testify and say that on Wednesday morning last, near ten of the o'clock, we saw near one hundred of regular troops being in the town of Concord at the North Bridge in said town, so called, and having passed the same, they were taking up said bridge when about three hundred of our militia were advancing towards said bridge, in order to pass said bridge, when, without saying anything to us, they discharged a number of guns on us, which killed two men dead on the spot, and wounded several others. When we returned fire on them, which killed two of them, and wounded several, which was the beginning of hostilities in the town of Concord. Bradbury Robinson, Taddeus Bancroft, Samuel Spring, James Adams. Worcester, April 26th, 1775. Hannah Brandish, of that part of Cambridge called Menno to me, and daughter of Timothy Payne of Worcester, in the county of Worcester, Esquire, of lawful age, testifies and says that about five o'clock on Wednesday last afternoon, being in her bedchamber with her infant child, about eight days old, she was surprised by the firing of the king's troops and our people on their return from Concord. She, being weak and unable to go out of her house, in order to secure herself and family, they all retired into the kitchen, in the back part of the house. She soon found the house surrounded with the king's troops, that upon observation made, at least seventy bullets were shot into the front part of the house. Several bullets lodged in the kitchen where she was, and one passed through an easy chair she had just gone from. The door of the front part of the house was broke open. She did not see any soldiers in the house, but supposed by the noise they were in the front. After the troops had gone off, she missed the following things, which she verily believes were taken out of the house by the king's troops, viz. One rich brocade gown, called a negligee, one lustring gown, one white quilt, one pair of brocade shoes, three shifts, eight white aprons, three caps, one case of ivory knives and forks, and several other small articles. Hannah Brandish Province of Massachusetts Bay, Worcester, S.S., April 26, 1775. Mrs. Hannah Brandish, the above deponent, maketh oath before us, the subscribers to of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace for the County of Worcester and of the Quorum, that the above deposition, according to her best recollection, is the truth, which deposition is taken in perpetuum rei memoriam. Thomas Steele, Timothy Payne. End of part 20. 
Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Part 21 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 21. Concord, April 23, 1775. I, James Marr, of lawful age, testify and say that in the evening of the 18th instant I received orders from George Hutchinson, adjutant of the 4th Regiment of Regular Troops stationed at Boston, to prepare and march, to which orders I attended and marched to Concord, where I was ordered by an officer with about 100 men to guard a certain bridge there. While attending that service, a number of people came along, in order, as I suppose, to cross said bridge, at which time a number of the regular troops first fired upon them. James Marr Medford, April 25th, 1775 I, Edward Thoroton Gould, of His Majesty's own regiment of foot, being of lawful age, do testify and declare that on the evening of the 18th instant, under the orders of General Gage, I embarked with the light infantry and grenadiers of the line, commanded by Colonel Smith, and landed on the marshes of Cambridge, from whence we proceeded to Lexington. On our arrival at that place, we saw a body of provincial troops, armed to the number of about sixty or seventy men. On our approach they dispersed, and soon after firing began, but which party fired first I cannot exactly say, as our troops rushed on shouting and huzzaring previous to the firing, which was continued by our troops so long as any of the provincials were to be seen. From thence we marched to Concord. On a hill near the entrance of the town, we saw another body of provincials assembled. The light infantry companies were ordered up the hill to disperse them. On our approach they retreated towards Concord. The grenadiers continued the road under the hill towards the town. Six companies of light infantry were ordered down to take possession of the bridge which the provincials retreated over. The company I commanded was one. Three companies of the above detachment went forward about two miles. In the meantime, the provincial troops returned to the number of about three or four hundred. We drew up on the Concord side of the bridge. The provincials came down upon us, upon which we engaged and gave the first fire. This was the first engagement after the one at Lexington. A continued firing from both parties lasted through the whole day. I myself was wounded at the attack of the bridge, and am now treated with the greatest humanity, and taken all possible care of by the provincials at Medford. Edwin Thoroton Gould, Lieutenant, King's Own Regiment. Province of Massachusetts Bay, Middlesex County, April 25th, 1775. Lieutenant Thoroton Gould, aforenamed, personally made oath to the truth of the foregoing declaration by him subscribed before us. Tad Mason, Josiah Johnson, Simon Tufts, Justices of the Peace for the County aforesaid, Quorum Unis. Province of Massachusetts Bay, Charleston, S.S. I, Nathaniel Gorham, notary and tabellian public by lawful authority, duly admitted and sworn, hereby certify to all whom it may or doth concern, that Taddeus Mason, Josiah Johnson, and Simon Tufts, Esquires, are three of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace, Quorum Unis, for the County of Middlesex, and that full faith and credit is and ought to be given to their transactions as such, both in court and out. In witness whereof, I have hereto unto affixed my name and seal, this twenty-sixth day of April, Anno Domini, 1775. Nathaniel Gorham, Notary Public, L.S. All of the above depositions are sworn to before Justices of the Peace and duly attested by the Notary's Public in the manner of the last one. In Provincial Congress, Watertown, April 26, 1775. To the inhabitants of Great Britain. Friends and fellow subjects, 
Hostilities are at a length commenced in this colony by the troops under the command of General Gage, and it being of the greatest importance that an early, true, and authentic account of this inhuman proceeding should be known to you, the Congress of this colony has transmitted the same, and from want of a session of the Honourable Continental Congress, think it proper to address you on the alarming occasion. By the clearest depositions relative to this transaction, it will appear that on the night preceding the 19th of April instant, a body of the King's troops, under the command of Colonel Smith, was secretly landed at Cambridge, with an apparent design to take or destroy the military and other stores provided for the defence of this colony, and deposited at Concord. That some inhabitants of the colony, on the night aforesaid, while travelling peaceably on the road between Boston and Concord, were seized and greatly abused by armed men, who appeared to be officers of General Gage's army. That the town of Lexington, by these means, was alarmed, and a company of the inhabitants mustered on the occasion. That the regular troops, on their way to Concord, marched into said town of Lexington, and the said company, on their approach, began to disperse. That, notwithstanding this, the regulars rushed on with great violence, and first began the hostilities, by firing on said Lexington company, whereby they killed eight, and wounded several others. That the regulars continued their fire, until those of said company, who were neither killed nor wounded, had made their escape. That Colonel Smith, with the detachment, then marched to Concord, where a number of provincials were again fired on by the troops, two of them killed, and several wounded, before the provincials fired on them and that these hostile measures of the troops produced an engagement that lasted through the day, in which many of the provincials and more of the regular troops were killed and wounded. To give a particular account of the ravages of the troops as they retreated from Concord to Charleston would be very difficult, if not impracticable. Let it suffice to say that a great number of the houses on the road were plundered and rendered unfit for use. Several were burnt, Women in childbed were driven by the soldiery naked into the streets. Old men peaceably in their houses were shot dead, and such scenes exhibited as would disgrace the annals of the most uncivilized nations. These, brethren, are marks of ministerial vengeance against this colony, for refusing with her sister colonies a submission to slavery. But they have not yet detached us from our royal sovereign. We profess to be his loyal and dutiful subjects, and so hardly dealt with as we have been, are still ready, with our lives and fortunes, to defend his person, family, crown, and dignity. Nevertheless, to the persecution and tyranny of his cruel ministry, we will not tamely submit, appealing to heaven for the justice of our cause, we determine to die or be free. We cannot think that the honour, wisdom, and valour of Britons will suffer them to be long inactive spectators of the measures in which they themselves are so deeply interested, measures pursued in opposition to the solemn protests of many noble lords, an express sense of conspicuous commoners whose knowledge and virtue have long characterised them as some of the greatest men in the nation, measures executing contrary to the interests, petitions, and resolves of many large, respectable, and opulent counties, cities, and boroughs in Great Britain, measures highly incompatible with justice, but still pursued with a specious pretense of easing the nation of its burdens, measures which, if successful, must end in the ruin and slavery of Britain, as well as the persecuted American colonies. We sincerely hope that the great sovereign of the universe, who hath so often appeared for the English nation, will support you in every rational and manly exertion with these colonies, for saving it from ruin, and that in a constitutional connection with the mother country, we shall soon be altogether a free and happy people. Per order, Joseph Warren, President, P. T. End of Part 21 Recording by F. N. H. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk Part 22 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F&H. 
The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part 22. Names of Killed and Wounded at Lexington and Concord. The following list of the names of the first martyrs of the cause of American liberty is given in the 18th volume of the Massachusetts Historical Collections. Lexington. Killed. Jonas Parker. Robert Monroe. Samuel Hadley. Jonathan Harrington, Jr. Isaac Muzzy. Caleb Harrington. John Brown. Jebediah Moore. John Raymond. Nathaniel Wyman. 10. Wounded. John Robbins. Solomon Pierce. John Tidd. Joseph Comey. Ebenezer Monroe, Jr. Thomas Winship. Nathaniel Farmer. Prince Estabrook. Jebediah Monroe. Francis Brown. 10. Concord. Wounded. Charles Miles. Nathaniel Barrett. Abel Prescott, Jr. Jonas Brown. George Marriott. 5. Cambridge. Killed. William Marcy. Moses Richardson. John Hicks. Jason Russell. Jabez Wyman. Jason Winship. 6. Wounded. Samuel Whitmore. 1. Missing. Samuel Frost. Seth Russell. 2. Needham. Killed. John Bacon. Alicia Mills. Amos Mills. Nathaniel Chamberlain. Jonathan Parker. 5. Wounded. Eliza Kingsbury. Blank Tolman. 2. Sudbury. Killed. Josiah Haynes. Ashel Reed, 2. Wounded, Joshua Haynes, Jr., 1. Acton, killed. Isaac Davis, Abner Hosmer. James Hayward, 3. Wounded, Luther Blanchard, 1. Bedford, killed. Jonathan Wilson, 1. Wounded, Job Lane, 1. Woburn, killed. Daniel Thompson. Ashel Porter, 2. Wounded, George Reed, Jacob Bacon, Blank Johnson, 3. Medford, killed, Henry Putnam, William Polly, 2. Charleston, killed, James Miller, Edward Barber, 2. Watertown, killed, Joseph Coolridge, 1. Framington, wounded, Daniel Hemingway, 1. Dedham, killed, Elias Haven, 1. Wounded, Israel Everett, 1. Stowe, wounded. Daniel Connell, 1. Roxbury, missing. Elijah Seaver, 1. Brooklyn, killed. Isaac Gardner, 1. Bilirakia, wounded. John Nichols, Timothy Blanchard, 2. Chelmsford, wounded. Aaron Chamberlain, Oliver Barron, 2. Salem, killed. Benjamin Pierce, 1. Newton, wounded. Noah Wiswell, 1. Danvers, killed. Henry Jacobs, Samuel Cook, Ebenezer Goldthwaite, George Southwick, Benjamin Deland, Jotham Webb, Pearlie Putnam, 7. Wounded, Nathan Putnam, Dennis Wallace, 2. Missing, Joseph Bell, 1. Beverly, killed. Reuben Kerrymy, 1. Wounded, Nathaniel Cleves, Samuel Woodbury, William Dodge, 3. Lynn, killed. Abenigo Ramsell. Daniel Townsend. William Flint. Thomas Hadley, 4. Wounded, Joshua Felt. Timothy Monroe, 2. Missing, Josiah Breed, 1. Total killed, 49. Wounded, 39. Missing, 5. Total, 93. A catalogue of revolutionary articles in the Poughkeepsie Museum. The following among the collection of curiosities in the museum at Poughkeepsie. Original Manuscripts Letter of Washington to Governor Clinton, acquainting him of a design of the British to seize his person while residing at Poughkeepsie, and convey him to New York. Dated at Dobbs Ferry, 1780. Letter of Washington to Brigadier General Whitten, on the subject of the removal of the troops from Trenton to Philadelphia. Dated Plumpton Plains, New Jersey, 1777. Letter of Washington on the subject of promotions in the army, dated 1779. Note of invitation from Washington to Dr. John Thomas to dinner, 
Dr. Thomas was surgeon of the Massachusetts line, dated Headquarters, Newburgh, 1780. Soldier's Discharge, signed by Washington, 1782. Letter of the Marquis de Lafayette on the subject of fortifying North River, written to Governor Clinton in 1778. Letter of the Baron Steuben to Governor Clinton on the good appearance of the New York line of the army, dated New Windsor, 1780. Letter of Lord Stirling to Governor Clinton on the discharge of the command of Major Wessenfels, dated Albany, 1782. Letter of Clinton in reply. Resolution drawn up in Congress and signed by John Hancock, requesting the State of New York to erect a monument at continental expense to the memory of Brigadier General Herkimer, killed on the Mohawk in 1777, dated in Congress 1777. Letter of Captain Abraham Schneck, of Fishkill, containing an order for old linen rags for lint for the surgeon of his command, dated near Croton, 1776. Letter of General Heath, relating to beacons in the Highlands, dated Robinson's House, 1780. Letter of General Heath on the condition of the prisoners confined in the Provost Prison at West Point, dated Highlands, 1780. Letter of Captain Nathaniel Toms, describing a chase after the British over the Shuey Kill in 1777. Journal of Lemur Lyon, of Woodstock, Vermont, who served in the French and Indian War in the expedition against Ticonderoga, commanded by General Abercrombie. The journal commences on the 5th of April, 1758, and closes on the 16th of November, 1759. Journal of Samuel Hawes, one of the Minutemen called out on the day of the Battle of Lexington, commencing April 19th, 1775, and ending in January, 1776. Three original letters of Washington to Colonel Marinus Willett, relating to a secret expedition against Oswego in 1782, dated at Newburgh headquarters, 1782. Letter of Joshua H. Smith, the person who conducted Andre towards the British lines, directed from Goshen Jail to Governor Clinton, complaining of the state of his health and the closeness of his confinement, dated 1780. Letter of Ezekiel Hyatt of Compond, Westchester County, to James Jackson Esquire of Fishkill in Duchess County informing him that Husson, a notorious cowboy and freebooter, had gone up to steal his horses, and was to have a hundred guineas if he got them. Dated Compond, 1777. Letter of Lieutenant Lawrence, on the subject of the departure of the British fleet from the harbour of Newport. Dated Reading, 1780. Letter by the direction of Washington to Abraham Schneck and others of Fishkill, to solicit shirts of the inhabitants of their precinct for soldiers of the army, many of whom were utterly destitute of that article. Dated Kingston, 1780. Letter of Samuel Barker, while confined in the Provost Prison, New York, to his wife in Westchester County, dated Provost Prison, 1777. End of Part 22 Recording by FNH Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk Part 23 of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775. By Abraham Tomlinson. Part 23. Miscellaneous Articles. Lock of Washington's hair, an unquestionable relic, derived from the late Judge Thompson of the Supreme Court of the United States, presented by his recent widow, the present Mrs. Lansing, of Poughkeepsie. Fragments of the first coffin of Washington, presented by Louis Grube, Esquire, artist, Poughkeepsie. One of the points of the Chevaux de Frise, placed in the Hudson River, near Windsor, in 1780, to prevent the passage of the British ships. It was raised accidentally by the anchor of a sloop commanded by Captain Abraham Elting in New Palitz, Ulster County, in 1836. It is pointed with iron and weighs some hundreds of pounds. Wooden camp candlestick, used in General Smallwood's brigade, 
when encamped at Fishkill in Dutchess County in the Revolution. From Jackson Diddle, Esquire, Fishkill. Homespun linen rifle shirt, worn by Captain Abraham Duyer at the Battle of Long Island. From Charles Robinson, Esquire, Fishkill. Sheet of stamp parchment, containing the stamps and duties of the Stamp Act. Sword of Captain Archibald Campbell, killed at the skirmish at Ward's House in Westchester County in 1776. Captain Campbell was the commanding officer of the British party from his grandson, Captain Archibald Campbell, of Pauling's Duchess County. Sword of one of Lee's Legion of Virginia. It has inscribed on one side of the blade, Victory or Death. On the opposite side, Grenadiers of Virginia. Tooth of Miss Jane McCrea, found lying in her coffin when her remains were disinterred and removed to Fort Edward in 1824 by Mr. George Barker of Sandy Hill, and presented by him to the late Captain Matthew Danvers of Sandy Hill, and to the collection by his widow, Mrs. Mary Danvers of Poughkeepsie. Iron Pipe Tomahawk, found on the battlefield of Saratoga, from Van Wyck Brickenhoff, Esquire of Fishkill. Cannon Rammer, taken from Burgoyne at Saratoga, purchased with a lot of other lumber, sold at West Point by order of the government after the Revolution, by Joseph Jackson, Esquire, and others of Fishkill, from Van Wyck Brickenhoff, Esquire, of Fishkill. Knapsack of Captain David Uhl, a captain of militia in the Revolution, and worn by him when he joined his regiment at Harlem in 1776. It is made of homespun linen, from his daughter, Mrs. Henry Abdul, of Union Vale, Dutchess County. Hessian Camp Kettle, dug up on the battlefield of Bennington by Mr. Charles Hogue of Dover, Dutchess County. Iron Spur, found on the battlefield of Cowpens. It is much rusted and is believed to have belonged to one of Tarleton's men, from B. J. Lossing, Esquire, of Poughkeepsie. United States Musket, found on the line of the retreat of the Americans from the battleground at Hubberton, Vermont. It has the date of 1774 on the breach, from B. J. Lossing, Esquire. Collection of relics from all the battlefields of the Revolution, from B. J. Lossing, Esquire. Cocked hat, worn by Lemuel Lyon, on board the tea ship in Boston Harbor. The wearer was the writer of the first journal in this volume, from his relative Mr. J. Colby, of New York City. Surgical instruments of Dr. John Thomas, a regimental surgeon in the Revolution. They were used in several of the principal battles of the war, from his son, Mr. Thomas of Poughkeepsie. An original portrait of Dr. John Thomas. Broken United States bayonet, found on the battleground of Guilford Courthouse, North Carolina, by Mr. Charles Ney of Armenia, Dutchess County. Bayonet of John Woodin, a Continental soldier. The point of this instrument was broken off in the wall of the fort of Stony Point when in the body of a British soldier, presented by a relative. A Spanish dollar, taken from the cavity of the hip bone of a skeleton dug up at Bemis Heights, Saratoga, in 1841. With it were five other dollars and an English guinea, and also a fragment of leather, supposed to be the remains of a purse or pocketbook, from Mrs. John Wing of Washington, Dutchess County. English musket, taken in a skirmish from the foraging party of the British in Westchester County in the Revolution, by Captain Abraham Marriott of Newcastle, Westchester County, commander of a party of American militia, from Mr. John Townsend of Poughkeepsie. Tory musket, hidden during the whole period of the Revolution in a hollow tree in Dover, Dutchess County, to prevent its being seized by the committee men and used against the king. English musket, bought off from the battlefield of White Plains by Colonel Abraham Humphrey of Smallwood's Brigade, presented by the late Colonel Humphrey Cornell of Beacom, Dutchess County. Fragments of human bones from the battlefield of Red Bank, from B.J. Lossing, Esquire, of Poughkeepsie. Piece of one of the palmetto logs of Old Fort Moultrie in Charleston Harbour, from B.J. Lessing, Esquire. Horn of Lieutenant Charles Wallace of the 1st Royal Highland Regiment, curiously engraved with the names and distances of all the fortified posts from Quebec to Albany, together with the name and rank of the wearer. It was obtained from an Indian after the Battle of Saratoga. 
Metal Button, ploughed up on Quaker Hill, Dutchess County, where a division of the American array encamped in the Revolution. It has the letters U.S.A. engraved on a surface. A number of other articles belonging to the camp have been found in the neighborhood. A long line of stone fireplaces of the soldiers still remain. Spontoon of Lieutenant Alfred Van Wyck of Fishkill, Dutchess County, used in hunting the cowboys in Fishkill Mountain in the Revolution. By his son, Theodorus Van Wyck Esquire of Fishkill Hook, who remembers to have been shown within the last forty years by an individual then living, the bones of a skinner or cowboy still lying unburied in a defile of the mountains. See also a large collection of other curiosities. The End End of part 23. Recording by FNH. Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk. End of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, 1758-1775, by Abraham Tomlinson.